way, I am trying to monitor, in addition to paying attention to the meeting, some of the various platforms that this is, uh, that this is being broadcast in to try to bring some of those uh, comments into the meeting since we can't obviously hear from folks in person tonight. Um, here's another comment. Getting background noise may be from technical support staff, but not the live feed. I don't know. Um, but, uh, the good news is the videos seem to be working, so that's great. We got that, that going on. Um, and I'm open to suggestions about whether or not we move forward or wait a little bit longer. So, I'm getting indications that they can hear us, at least on television. OK, great. OK, looks like the, they've cleared up the problem. Uh, I'm now hearing this. So. Um, we, we are not in our council chambers where normally we have a beautiful um, American flag. Uh, so instead, I'm gonna temporarily change my background to the American flag uh, while, while I uh, lead the pledge. So now I also have to stand, so see if I can, there we go. All right. Um, okay, uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Reese, and thank you for helping us to uh, delay until we could get a little better situation uh, with the vid with the audio. Thank you. There we go. So we've we've had our moment of silence. We've honored Representative Marianne Black, Brother Ray Earhart, and our one Durham resident so far who has died from the coronavirus. And now we'll have the roll call. Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll now move to our ceremonial items, and we do have a couple of ceremonial items. Uh, the first is National Community Development Week. Community, National Community Development Week uh, annually recognized the importance of community development block grant, CDBG, and home investment partnership programs. CDBG remains the principal source of federal revenue for states, localities, and their program partners to use in assisting low and moderate income people to prevent physical, economic, and social deterioration in neighborhoods and communities across the country. CDBG and home dollars allow the city to successfully undertake the Southside Revitalization Project Dents and apartments primarily for homeless veterans, the Witted School for low income seniors, and the permanently affordable Piedmont rentals for very low income households, just to name a few. And here's the proclamation. Whereas the week of April 13th through April 17th, 2020, has been designated as National Community Development Week by the National Community Development Association to celebrate the Community Development Block Grant Program and the Home Partnership Program. And whereas since 1975, the CDBG program has provided annual funding and flexibility to local communities to provide decent, safe and affordable housing, a suitable living environment and economic opportunities to low and moderate income people. And whereas since 1992, the HOME program has provided funding to local communities to create decent, safe and affordable housing opportunities for low income persons with over 1 million units of affordable housing having been completed nationally using HOME funds. And whereas over the past five years, the city of Durham has received a total of $9,417,000 in CDBG funds and $4,642,000 in home funds. And whereas the city of Durham has used CDBG and home funds directly or in partnerships to address issues surrounding homelessness, including veteran homelessness, to promote home ownership opportunities for low and moderate income households, to develop hundreds of affordable rental units for low and very low income households, to provide repairs to homes of very low income seniors and to help revitalize neighborhoods and to leverage millions of dollars in additional public and private investments within the Durham neighborhoods. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim April 13th through 17th, 2020, as National Community Development Week in Durham to support these two valuable programs that have made a tremendous contribution to the vitality of the city's housing stock, infrastructure, public services, and the economic vitality of our community. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this, the 6th day of April, 2020. 
Can I have the uh, traditional applause? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, second, we will have National Crime Victims' Rights Week, uh, another important uh, proclamation. Uh, the, 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 uh, the Victim Services Unit of the Durham Police Department offers support and services to victims, victims of violent crimes, homicides, armed robberies, aggravated and sexual assault, and other serious felonies. These services include, but are not limited to, crisis intervention, referrals for community resources, investigative support, assistance with the filing of victim compensation claims, advising victims of their rights, educating victims about the criminal justice system and what to expect, accompaniment to court and medical appointments. The Victim Services Unit in 2019 served 1,628 cases. Three full-time victim and witness service coordinators serviced 2,350 victims in 2019. The unit referred victims to outside resources a total number of 4,841 times during the year and services are provided in both English and Spanish. The first, first National Crime Vic Rights Victim Week ceremony was celebrated in 1981 under President Ronald Reagan. The annual recognition continues every year in the month of April as a way to renew our country's commitment to guarantee that all individuals have the rights and services that they need to recover from victimization. This year's national theme is Seek Justice, Ensure Victims' Rights, Inspire Hope. And now the proclamation. Whereas these are unprecedented times in the history of our nation, region, state, and the city of Durham as the coronavirus pandemic escalates. And whereas even in times of a worldwide health crisis, the critical work of law enforcement, judicial systems, and crime victims' rights advocates remains necessary. And whereas crime can leave a lasting impact on any person, regardless of age, national origin, race, creed, religion, gender, sexual orientation, immigration, or economic status, and whereas the formation of the City of Durham Police Department's Victim Witness Services Unit in 1997 demonstrates the department's strong commitment to providing essential services to victims and witnesses of crimes and to ensuring that crime victims are treated with respect, compassion, fairness, and dignity. And whereas the department's victim services advocates continue to render services during this challenging time, supporting citizens and residents in the aftermath of crime victimization, crime victims whose sense of grief, loss, fear, and anxiety is likely further heightened by the effects of COVID-19. And whereas now more than ever, the ideals of compassion, respect, healing, recovery, and hope resonate now with all of our residents. And whereas National Crime Victims' Rights Week 2020, Seek Justice, Ensure Victims' Rights, Inspire Hope, the theme for this year provides a timely opportunity to collectively commit to these ideals as a community by focusing on our common humanity. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shull, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of April 19th to 25th, 2020, as National Crime Victims' Rights Week in Durham, and hereby encourage Durham citizens to take the time to learn more about crime victims' rights and to find ways to nurture resilience and hope in the lives of crime victims and others who are in need of specific support, special support, during this time of challenge. Witness my hand, the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this, the sixth day of April, 2020. Thank you so much. And thank you all for those who work on, do the valuable work that is recognized by these proclamations. And now we'll proceed to announcements by members of the council. And uh, I'm going to uh, begin with council member Austin, who has an important announcement. unmute myself. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. I know we have very important uh, matters to discuss tonight, so I will uh, be brief, try to be. Um, today, I reluctantly submitted my resignation from the Durham City Council. Uh, before I reflect, reflect briefly on my, of my, on my time on this council, I want to acknowledge how profoundly uh, the COVID-19 virus is affecting all of our lives. Almost in an instant, people from all walks of life are afraid, facing uncertain economic circumstances, and looking to all of us for answers. There's far more about this virus that we don't know than do, but I want the public to rest assured that our courageous frontline workers in healthcare, public safety, sanitation, transportation, and food provision are doing all that they can to help keep us going. 
Our local government and public health staffs are also working tirelessly to keep basic infrastructure running and ease the impact of illness, loss of work, pay, and childcare on thousands of residents. We all stand ready to follow the advice of public health experts and give you the information you need to keep yourselves and your loved ones safe. Now, it's very likely that after this trying week, I will have to continue our work together in a different role. I'll, show, I'll share more about that role soon, but then the very likely event that this is my final opportunity to address all of you as a member of the Durham City Council. I brief, briefly want to thank the residents of Durham for allowing me to serve Ward 3 and this wonderful city. I am the lone Durham native on this council. My roots go back in this area more than five generations. My ancestors were enslaved on, on land near where I live today. My grandparents cleaned homes in Trinity Park, tended farmland, and chauffeured doctors who worked at Duke Hospital. My mother was part of the first integrated class to graduate from Durham High School, and I myself attended school in Durham even when I lived in a neighboring county. Many years later, during the Great Recession, I moved back to Durham, deep in student loan debt, unsure if I would get a paycheck each month, certain that my credit card would get declined when I brought groceries or beer at one of the only bars in downtown at the time. I could not have imagined then that 10 years later, I would get the chance to serve an elected office in a town that I could hardly afford to live or play in 10 years ago and that in a city that holds so much of my love and so much of my history. We are staring now into a kind of unknown that feels familiar in many ways, but that history tells us very little about. Many of our residents are sick. Others who are already struggling to pay their rents or afford basic necessities are now facing unemployment. And our city is reeling from shuttered downtown storefronts and an economy in shock. The bad news is, it will take a long time for us to recover. The good news is Durham is an extraordinarily capable hands that can lead our recovery. And for that, I am personally grateful. To our administration and our staff, all of your work is essential. Even in this moment when people are fixed on government responses, so much of your work goes unheralded. Many of you risk your health to keep our city running, and I know that this crisis weighs on all of you just as much as it does all of us. Thank you for the sacrifices you are making. Thank you for your exceptional work under unimaginable stress. And thank you for making our city what it is. It has been a gift to represent your work to our residents. To my colleagues, I never took a hug, a handshake, or a fist bump for granted for many of you. Because frankly, our work is hard and your collegial, collegial nature has always been a comfort. But I wish now more than ever that I could thank you with the kind, with the kind of caring gestures that you've always ex extended to me. For now though, I'll say, you are a compassionate and brilliant group of people. I am proud to have worked together. I'm proud of the work that we've done and I'm prouder yet to have done this work with each and every one of you. I will miss you all greatly. To Durham, I am yours. And because of that, I know your spirit. This community has responded to this moment in exactly the way that I expected and in exactly the way that we needed. You're working together, fighting for each other, and trusting that together we will make it through this current crisis. One month ago at the end of our mayor's powerful and moving State of the City address, which set an ambitious tone for the next year, a student group sang Andrew Day's Rise Up. Part of that song goes, when the silence isn't quiet, and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe, and you know you feel like dying, I promise we will take the world to its feet and move mountains. I'll rise up, rise up unafraid, and I'll do it a thousand times again. We could not have known then how poignant those words would be just weeks later. Durham, right now the silence isn't quiet. It feels hard to breathe. But we will take the world to its feet. We will move mountains and we will rise up. To everyone listening, please stay home, stay safe. We are with you. I am with you and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.
Thank you so much, Council Member Austin, for those beautiful words. And no one could have said it better. Wonderful expression of where our city is at this time. We will miss you tremendously. Um, we'll be in close contact with you as you move to represent our city in the legislature, and you're going to do an amazing job. Uh, but we will really miss you on this council. And uh, we hate to lose you. Um, I hate to go. Yeah. But um, it, you, you'll, you'll still be with us, and you'll be doing amazing things. And thank you for those fantastic words. They were wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Um, and now I'll ask other announcements by members of the council. Anybody who wants to raise your hand so I can see you. Okay, I don't see a hand up. I have a very few words. Um, just wanted just to mention that we have received public comment for this meeting. I appreciate our city clerk uh, opening a portal to allow a public comment in the form of emails. We've all been given the emails and uh, there are 34 of them. They all involve one topic, uh, which is the topic of curbside service for breweries, which uh, we will, we can, we'll, when we get to a later part of our meeting, we can certainly uh, discuss where we are on that. But I did want to mention and appreciate that we have the public comment available. Um, I want to report just a little bit to our council and to our city where, how we're doing in this fight against the coronavirus. Um, in in many respects, as hard as this is, um, in one very important respect, we're doing well. In the past week, our daily rate of in, in coronavirus case increase has gone, has fallen from about 12% per day to about nine, to about 8% per day. Uh, we are the large county in the state that has the slowest rate of growth of coronavirus cases, which we can be very proud of. Uh, travel in Durham is down more than 40%. People are taking the stay at home order very, very, um, they're doing very well with it and taking it very seriously and social distancing and it's making a difference. We are flattening the curve. Uh, how do we compare to other regions around the country and around the world? I think it's very important to know. So uh, we know that we're no, we know the worst are places like uh, New Orleans and, and New York. Uh, and we know that Washington was a hot spot for a while, although it's, it's improving. Our rate of case increase on the 27th day, we had, since we began having cases for 27th day, our rate of increase is about the same as South Korea. Uh, one of the places in the world that has done the best with the coronavirus. So if we continue to do this work well, if we continue to stay socially distanced, I believe and our public health folks believe that we can continue to flatten the curve. The modeling from Duke University Health System says that we estimate the peak of our cases to be between April 24th and May the 2nd. And that has been consistent in, in the modeling that they have done. This is a very hard time. And I, again, Councilmember Austin said it better than I can, but it needs to be said again. Our, our hearts go out to everyone in Durham who is suffering in some way because of this coronavirus. People have lost their jobs all over the country and right here in Durham. And I know many of us have gotten emails of difficulties uh, accessing the unemployment system and you know all kinds of difficulties that people are facing to the businesses that have had to shut their doors temporarily and hopefully only temporarily our hearts go out to you there are so many people in durham who are suffering because of this and we all want you to know how much we care and how much we're trying every day to get our city safely through this and to tell you all that the more quickly we can get through our peak and the more we can flatten the curve, the more quickly we can reopen our businesses and Durham can be back in business again. We hope that this won't be long, but it depends on us. If we can successfully social, socially distance, 
and we can stay safe and we can flatten the curve. We will keep our medical, our healthcare workers safe. We won't overburden our hospital and make it impossible for each of us to get good medical care should we need it. And we will be able to more quickly get back into business as a city. And that is that is our aim and that is that is something that we have to do together. Um, but we are doing amazing work and we, every one of us, is working hard to do what we need to do and giving the gift of distance. It's a gift now. It's a kindness. I want to say that I believe deeply in this separation of church and state. We don't have prayers at our council meetings. and um, But I, I do want to note that this is an important week for many religious people. This is the week of Easter. It's the week of Passover. And I wanted to just tell our community that I've asked one of our council members, a pastor himself, Mark Anthony Middleton, uh, to compose a prayer during this week for our city, that our churches and synagogues and mosques can share this week, people of all denominations. And he's agreed to do so, and I really appreciate that. I want to ask everyone to please stay at home. Uh, please do what we need to do to keep yourself safe and everyone else safe. Give your love from a distance. Take care of the elders. Be safe. We can do this together. We can fight this virus together. Each of us can act so all of us are safe. All right. Um, and now we'll move into priority items. And I'll ask first, is there a priority is for the, of the city manager? Are there any priority items, Mr. Manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone, members of council. Uh, I'll have some remarks uh, in a few minutes, but for now I have no priority items. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. M Madam Attorney. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of city council, Madam Mayor Bertem. The city attorney's office has no priority items this evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Good evening, everyone. The city clerk's office has no items. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All righty, and now we'll move into our first item, which is the report on the city's response to COVID-19. And I'm gonna uh, turn this uh, over to the city manager. Uh, thank you again, Mayor, uh, members of the city council. Uh, before we move into the more structured discussion on a variety of the COVID-19 topics, I would like to take a few minutes and uh, pr provide some uh, prepared remarks. As you know, the city of Durham was hit with a malware attack on the evening of March the 6th, which significantly impacted our data and communications networks. This malware attack was followed very quickly with the realization of the impact COVID-19 would have on our community and the way many services could safely be provided to our residents. These back-to-back -back events have challenged us all beyond anything we could ever have, ex ever have experienced or even imagined. The City of Durham staff has always been at the pinnacle of public service professionalism and capabilities. Every time the bar has been raised, our staff has responded with resolve, innovation, and dedication to public service. And I wanna use this opportunity to express my gratitude and appreciation to all of our employees and their past, present, and future commitment of service to our community and the residents of Durham. It is truly my honor to be a part of, a part of them. Today, we have approximately 1,250 front live employees working every day and receiving premium pay. We also have 700 employees telecommuting, tele teleworking every day to keep Durham running. And at the same time, we have continued to pay and provide pay and benefits to other, an approximate 220 full-time and 250 part-time employees who are ready to support our services when called. As has been said, we have a long road ahead and no one knows for sure where it will lead and who will be impacted, but I have never been more proud or confident that our employees will respond and be up to the challenge of keeping our community safe ever working to recover and return Durham to the community that we love and cherish. Thank you. 
Mr. Mayor, we have a number of staff people who uh, are prepared to, uh, to respond to a variety of issues that you have uh, asked us to address this evening. Uh, I don't know if you have a particular order that you, uh, you want them addressed. Uh, I will defer to you, but uh, uh, if there are, they, are, they are ready and I can uh, jump back in whenever that time comes. I think you'd wanted to hear about some operational issues. Oh no, you want to hear about the EOC first? Yes, I was uh, I was thinking we would first hear about the EOC, uh, then about the operational issues, and then uh, the any order that you wanted to uh, call the uh, departmental reports. Thank Is that you, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the first uh, uh, speaker will be Jim Groves. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor. Council members, uh, this is Jim Groves. I hope you can see me okay. Yes, we can, Jim. Thank you, sir. Um, so uh, one, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to talk with you this evening. Uh, I'd like to give you a, a quick brief of what we've been doing in the EOC and maybe actually share what the Emergency Operations Center uh, is uh, for the folks that are listening in or tuning in um, and, and kind of get a, a better understanding of what that is. Uh, the EOC or the Emergency Operations Center is a centralized function that provides interagency coordination that is supported by executive decision making in support of emergencies and disasters. So really what that means is the EOC is structured to promote communication, information sharing, and, and a better way that we can understand and coordinate and collaborate together to respond to any emergency or disaster. Uh, and during and Durham County, uh, our EOC is structured to really promote accountability and action. Um, we have it structured similarly to the Incident Command System or ICS, uh, where we have an EOC manager that's responsible uh, for the daily or the operational period actions that's going on within the EOC. You all may know that Ms. Leslie O'Connor uh, has been taking care of those duties uh, since the beginning of uh, COVID. Um, within uh, the realm of the EOC manager, they are supported by uh, the uh, public information officer within the EOC, the liaison officer within the EOC, and then a safety officer within the EOC. And they also have different chiefs, and that's not a rank, that's a title within the Emergency Operations Center, uh, but they have an operations chief that really does the hands-on work of uh, what we're being asked to do. We have a planning section chief that is constantly looking forward 12 to 24 hours and finding out and determining and planning for what we need to be doing um, before uh, the next operational period begins. We have a finance and admin administration section chief that is looking at the total funds that we're spending uh, on resources, on personnel, on supplies. And then uh, lastly, we have a logistics section chief and the logistics section chief is really looking at those resources and resource management that we need uh, to bring every effort that we can to, to respond to whatever event that we're dealing with. Each of those chiefs has a, a, a large staff that's working with them to accomplish these tasks. For example, in the operations section, uh, we have a human services branch, we have a public safety branch, and we have an infrastructure branch. And within each of those branches, those people are working on specific tasks. Uh, for an example, uh, one of the interagency groups that under operations is uh, the homeless population and how we're dealing with that with COVID and also food security and how we're dealing with that. Um, and then also we're working with the public schools on, on the things that are going on uh, with them and the children being out of school. Um, the EOC is typically set up for any type of hazard that we may need to respond to, but specifically for the COVID event, we're operating just a little differently than we typically do um, for public health. Usually when we activate, emergency management is set by ordinance to be in charge and running this. We know that public health, and this is a public health event, really is the subject matter expert. So uh, within our activation of this EOC, uh, we are fully in support of public health and anything that they may need. So our main job is to get the cadence of the operations, to make sure we're getting briefings done, to make sure we're giving situational reports, to make sure we're sharing 
information appropriately across uh, all different areas of the city and the county, private, public, nonprofit, to, to just make sure folks kind of know uh, really what's going on. Um, that's a really high overview of, of what's going on with the EOC. I can tell you that we were monitoring uh, the COVID before it ever came to Durham County. Um, we activated the emergency operations center before COVID was in Durham County. Uh, we drafted uh, the state of emergency um, to make sure that we were prepared for anything that may happen as a result of this. We continue to do long-term planning. We're looking weeks in advance to, to think if this thing really goes out of control, although the, 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 the message that you shared, Mr. Mayor, that uh, we are really low on the curve, which is beautiful, to say that turns around. And so we're planning on weeks that if it does not stay to that trend, we're prepared and we've got a plan to, to be able to do that. And then obviously we're fielding questions from management and from elected officials uh, to make sure that they are able to share with their constituents as much as they can. Happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, Jim, thank you so much. And thank you for your leadership. And thanks to Leslie, uh, who's been wonderful and all the folks in the EOC. And I know this time you've had a, usually the EOC is a kind of tight act. I've been in there during during uh, previous uh, emergencies and everybody's sitting in the same rooms, real shoulder to shoulder. And sir. this is a whole nother ball game for you all as well. It, it is, sir. Um, and you know, we had to activate our emergency operations center actually in the HHS building this time because uh, unfortunately the our existing EOC is just not set up to be able to um, facilitate social distancing like we need to. So we did move over to the ABC classrooms at HHS to be able to accomplish that safely for our staff and, and support staff. Great. All righty, thank you so much. And I'm now gonna ask council members if you have a question for Mr. Groves, if you could raise your hand and I hope I'll be able to see it. Uh, council member Reese. All right, I think I've unmuted myself. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, there've been a couple of comments um, from members of the public um, on the Facebook stream about uh, that are folks that are concerned about the fact that uh, the Durham Public Schools uh, ended, uh, at least for now, uh, its meal program uh, for kids in the public schools. Uh, today, I believe they gave a number of meals to kids. Um, and now we're, the uh, parents are getting guidance about other programs. I'm wondering if, uh, Jim, if you can talk a little bit about uh, what uh, the folks at the AOC know about the options that are available to families right now. So I, I can share with you that we have been in close communication with the schools and the support agencies and the volunteer agencies that uh, may support the feeding for the children. Um, we have a, a phone call plan with them tomorrow to try to facilitate a, uh, a successful outcome with this. So we do not have uh, children and families going unfed. Um, but I think that's the, the, the best information I can share with you is um, we have assembled a team, an interagency task force that is working with the public schools that includes volunteer organizations, nonprofit organizations, uh, and anyone, any subject matter expert that we think that we can bring to bear uh, to have those conversations to try to develop a solution for this. Let me uh, just add, uh, Jim, thank you. Um, it's uh, today, uh, as Councilmember Reese said, uh, Durham Public Schools gave out meals. They have been feeding about 5,500 uh, children a day. Uh, they gave out meals, my understanding is today, to last for the week. Uh, you know, uh, lots of food with stable, stable shelf life. And uh, I know that the Durham Public Schools Foundation uh, is working hard to step into the breach. Uh, when, when Durham Public Schools announced it could no longer do this because of lack of personnel, uh, the Durham Public Schools Foundation is stepping up to work with the public schools to organize the feeding of these children. It's going to cost a lot of money, uh, and there are people who are contributing mightily, uh, but I will say to members of our public, one way you can help is to contribute to the Durham Public Schools Foundation who's gonna be working to feed these children, as Jim said, It'll take a lot of partners, but uh, they're they're planning to step up and uh, and 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 lead this effort and have 
done a lot of really good work to do so. Councilmember Reese, another another uh, comment or question. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, just wanted to say uh, how grateful I am for your leadership on this issue. Uh, if I if I'm correctly informed, I believe your family has posted a ten thousand dollar match. Uh, so any members of the public who want to um, support feeding our Durham Public Schools families, but also maybe uh, make it a little bit painful for the mayor, uh, this is a great opportunity um, to, uh, to hit them where it hurts um, and do it for our kids. And so I intend, to, as soon as we're done here today, I intend to do my part uh, on that. So thank you, Mr. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member. Other questions or comments from Mr. Groves? All righty, seeing none, Jim, thank you. Mr. Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to address uh, you and the council. We really appreciate what you're doing. It's hard and you've always been such a good leader. So thank yous to you, thank you to Leslie, uh, Ari, everybody over there has just been doing great. So thank you. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Jim. Mr. Mayor, uh, next, I think we're gonna have uh, Bo Ferguson talk a bit about our uh, outward facing operations. Welcome, Bo. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council, good evening. It's, uh, I want to thank Jim Groves for his report and also add my sentiments uh, to those of City Manager Tom Bonfield who expressed appreciation and an acknowledgement of the, the privilege that it is to be part of this team right now uh, and to work with the employees who are doing such great work. It's, it's really been a privilege. And one group I just wanted to make brief comments about before my report, uh, one of the groups that's probably not getting mentioned as often uh, is those some odd, you know, 250 employees that, that Tom said are, are at home and not able to telework as well as a number of teleworkers who uh, it's really gut wrenching for them to not be reporting to work. And some of the reports that I'm getting from department directors is how they are being asked repeatedly by some of those staff, when can we come back and when can we get back in the field? Uh, and while we know it was absolutely the right decision to keep them home, uh, I want to reiterate that many of them perform extremely important and essential services for the citizens and the residents of Durham. And uh, we will be returning them as quickly as it's safe for our community to do so. But I wanted to acknowledge that uh, some of our heroes are the ones who are sitting at home uh, and helping us not to spread this. And I just wanted to, to point that out. Uh, briefly, I've been asked to just give a, a high-level overview of what departments in the operations portfolio are maintaining in terms of services right now, uh, and to note a few that have been uh, suspended. This is not a comprehensive list. Uh, just tried to pull out the highlights, uh, and I'd also note for anyone listening that this could change over time. Uh, we are uh, you know, constantly evaluating what services we're able to continue to provide and what the community needs right now, uh, but acknowledge that that could be changing in consultation with the manager and the leadership on the council as we move forward. So briefly and in no particular order, I wanted to walk through uh, the departments in the operations portfolio. There are nine departments. I'll be reporting on eight, and I know that the police chief, Sarah Davis, is on this call as well, and she'll provide uh, any uh, information from the police department separately. So. Beginning first with the Public Works Department, uh, for services that we are definitely maintaining and continuing to provide, uh, we are still providing emergency street and concrete repairs. Uh, we are providing limited litter collection and bus stop cleaning just at those high use facilities. Uh, there is, uh, and this goes for several departments, including water management and parks and recreation, we are providing limited construction inspection and plan review to support the ongoing residential and commercial development activity in the city. Uh, but some key public works services that are currently suspended are permanent and long range uh, concrete and asphalt repairs, stormwater maintenance services are suspended, uh, all capital projects, and I'll repeat this when we get to general services, but, but any large capital construction projects underway in the city have been paused to ensure that as many people as possible are staying home. Uh, obviously, with all of our facilities closed, all of our walk-in customer service has been suspended at any city facility, and field investigation of any stormwater complaints has also been uh, suspended. Moving on to water management and those services that are ongoing, obviously all our water and wastewater plants have to remain online, uh, and all the maintenance at those plants must continue. Uh, but we are modifying shifts and schedules to limit as much uh, employee to employee contact and exposure as possible. The water distribution and sewer collection system maintenance has to continue to make sure that that system uh, provides safe water and safe sewer services to our city. 
But again, we have reduced staffing to only perform uh, reactive maintenance or work activities that are required by our collection system permits. Our utility billing and meter reading is continuing. Our lift station maintenance is continuing as well. Uh, and previously I mentioned that development support continues. A few things that we have suspended that are uh, in the water management uh, area of services, any in-home water use assessments uh, have been suspended. Uh, we will do online or uh, we will do uh, telephone consultations with people who have questions or concerns. Likewise, uh, we will not go into homes right now for water quality testing and sampling, but we can take samples for people who have water quality concerns from an outside hose or faucet. So that is something that continues. Uh, and finally, as has been widely publicized, there are uh, no service disconnections for non-payment going on right now, no late fees for uh, anyone uh, who is struggling to pay their bills at this time. Moving on to solid waste, uh, garbage and recycling maintain uh, a normal service and normal collections. We have reduced staffing on trucks from three to two uh, for our rear load trucks to uh, ensure appropriate social distancing. Our transfer station and convenience center remain open, but only to those customers who have contracts with us. That means that we're able to accept that waste uh, without any person-to-person -person contact. We did have to suspend kind of retail people who just use the convenience center for household trash or small customers so that we could eliminate that person-to-person -person contact. Um, all of our customer service operation remains functional. Those employees are working from home and our composting operation continues. We have suspended yard waste collections and bulky collections as well as bulk cardboard collections. We did that specifically to make sure that we could have enough staff to maintain the garbage and recycling collection. Those services will be restarted when we are able to provide the manpower to do so, but uh, likely not until the stay at home orders be lifted. Moving to general services, uh, some of our unsung heroes in this uh, unfortunate time have been our uh, custodians. And so we have had to maintain a core custodial services at critical facilities where we still have daily staff activity. Uh, and we certainly have very enhanced cleaning protocols that our custodians have put into place. Likewise, uh, the, the staff at our cemeteries uh, continue to perform burial services, uh, only limited services, but uh, still a very necessary service, unfortunately. Um, as well in general services, the monitoring of critical uh, building facilities and checking on buildings that have been closed and are not being uh, occupied by normal employees, we're doing basic checks to make sure all those buildings uh, maintain operations uh, and that we don't have any uh, maintenance problems in those buildings. Uh, from home, a number of our staff continue to work on all the various projects and portfolio uh, in this portfolio and all the real estate work that general services manages. Um, and uh, we are also uh, right now doing some limited monitoring of, of litter and landscaping in the landscape division of general services. Uh, also keeping an eye on, on litter and maintenance downtown and right of way, but most right of way maintenance right now has been suspended. Um, finally, our urban forestry group uh, is providing emergency response, uh, but, but not uh, some of their core basic services. So the suspended functions in general services includes construction projects, all projects managed by general services, all the capital projects and enhancements that they manage have been suspended. Um, most of our landscaping service, uh, as mentioned previously, mowing and litter cleanup have all been deferred. Um, urban forestry, their tree planting work and their non-urgent tree requests are deferred. Uh, and obviously there's no uh, KDB uh, activities going on. I would note here and again in parks and recreation that uh, at some point uh, right of way maintenance and parks mowing and maintenance, uh, while currently not considered uh, critical services, uh, may become critical service as the growing season continues. This does become a problem for site distances along the roadways as well as functional basic use of the parks. And so uh, several weeks in, we may move some of those employees into a limited operational role, but we'll be evaluating that as we move forward. So moving on to parks and recreation, uh, as well, uh, you all know that there are very limited on ongoing functions. Uh, the only facilities that remain open are parks, trails, and greenways. Um, we are not doing any core parks maintenance at this time, but again, that's something we may uh, stand up in a few weeks. Um, we are uh, working very hard in a virtual environment to continue to do all the wonderful things that DPR uh, does on a normal basis. So the marketing staff is working hard to make sure 
We're promoting leave no trace programs for people who do use the parks since we don't have normal loader pickup. Please take your trash with you and DPR is working very hard to push those messages as well as the important critical social distancing messages that, that uh, we need to have going in our parks. Uh, likewise, DPR has created a number of virtual programs. Uh, so if you go to DPR's YouTube channel, uh, you can and follow us on social media. You can see exercise classes, activities that parents can do with their children. Uh, we have a virtual egg hunt that DPR is planning that I'm excited to learn more about. We have very limited park inspections and uh, limited development review activities. As far as suspended uh, functions, mo most of the core functions in DPR have been suspended to include drop-in programs, leagues, and activities. They've all been canceled until further notice. We've canceled all special events through at least the end of May 2020. Uh, all rentals and, uh, and uh, uh, activities have been canceled at any uh, DPR facility until further notice. Uh, recreation centers and pools are closed, city lakes are closed, and many park amenities, including skate park, tennis courts, pickleball, disc golf courses, restrooms, dog parks, shelters, athletic fields, and basketball courts are all closed. Uh, that has remained uh, an area of concern for us, and so I'd take this opportunity for anyone who's listening to please respect the stay-at-home order. Uh, please respect that those facilities are not to be used at this time, and we're taking additional measures to secure those facilities to make sure they're not, uh, not being used. Our fleet department continues to provide core basic services to all the departments uh, with vehicles in the city. So their maintenance and repair of vehicles, especially to essential public health and safety vehicles uh, continues as well as a special disinfectant uh, and cleaning protocols for those vehicles. And of course, fleet continues to acquire and distribute fuel for all the important city fleet. Um, lower level maintenance within the fleet department has been suspended until further notice. Moving to the public safety departments, uh, our fire department are critical first line responders during this time and very grateful for all the precautions and uh, excellent service they're providing. Uh, as, as expected, fire suppression uh, and emergency medical service, technical rescue, hazardous materials, vehicle accident, and other rescue type responses have all been maintained. However, we have uh, been following uh, the direction of the county medical director and have changed our EMS response protocol for fire personnel. Uh, they are being dispatched uh, only on critical calls at this time, not to a non-emergency or non-critical calls. And of course have a great deal of uh, protocol that they are following in those scenarios to keep our first responder firefighters safe. Fire investigations do continue. Some minimal construction related fire inspections uh, and referral or life safety complaints uh, continue to be investigated as well as foster care in inspections. Um, we are still able to offer a smoke alarm and CO alarm delivery, but we are not going into homes. We're not making contact with residents, uh, not able to install those as is our normal protocol. So the, the functions they have suspended, again, the, the first responder EMS role has been scaled back to only be for critical uh, situations. A number of, uh, of educational events that our fire department does so well have all been canceled. Uh, fire station visits have been canceled and a number of other uh, of community outreach activities as well as our ongoing recruitment uh, efforts in the department have been paused. Uh, the last department I'll report out on is Emergency Communications 911. Uh, this group, uh, with the help of our excellent technology services department, made a tremendous recovery from the malware attack uh, and uh, pleased to say that all of their uh, systems remained operational, but uh, through tremendous efforts of a number of staff. Now uh, our 911 system is fully functional, has remained fully functional and is not seeing any uh, service related reductions due to COVID while we're taking a number of measures to protect our staff uh, and ensure that uh, protocols are followed that, to, to keep them distant. We have not had to scale back and will not be scaling back any 911 services. They remain a critical part, not just of responding uh, to this emergency, but also providing good information to first responders in fire EMS and, and the police department who are heading out to calls to make sure uh, that they know if they're heading to a COVID related call and to take appropriate precautions. Uh, so Mr. Mayor, as I said earlier, uh, the police department is on this call. They're the ninth department, obviously playing a critical role and they'll report out separately, but that concludes my comments. I'm happy to answer any questions now or follow up with council later if there's information.
Uh, Mayor, thank you for that great report. Let me, uh, uh, Mr. Manager. Yeah, let me just jump in real quick if I could. Uh, in the interest of time, I didn't have each of the deputy city managers, uh, you know, prepare uh, remarks about their operations. I thought most of the pieces that council members and the public would be concerned about, Mr. Ferguson could cover. Uh, but I did uh, want to mention certainly in uh, a lot of a lot of behind the scenes things going on with technology solutions. Paychecks are still getting sent out. Uh, you know, bills are still being paid. All of the telecommuting work that's going on that most people don't know happens. They just take for granted anyway. And then in the community building portfolio, uh, you'll hear more about the uh, the work that OEWD is is doing with small business. Uh, we are still uh, fairly operational in the uh, development services arena, both in the planning and the inspections departments. Uh, they are doing everything uh, online. Uh, we still have inspectors going out because we still have a tremendous uh, construction activity going on. And then uh, you'll hear from uh, community development shortly, but also uh, even neighborhood improvement services is looking for opportunities to continue community engagement virtually. And uh, there's quite a bit going on there too. So that the uh, danger in, uh, in starting to report about who's doing what is you always leave somebody out and uh, I'll hear about it first thing in the morning, but I did want to mention those that uh, uh, came to the top of my mind. Certainly, uh, Bo is uh, prepared to respond to any of those operational questions uh, as, the, as am I, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Manager. And thank you, Bo, for a great report. And now I'm gonna uh, ask for questions. Council Member Reese. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Bo, uh, fantastic report. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say how much I appreciate um, the continued service of our frontline employees who are uh, making this city work at the most difficult time in our history, really an unprecedented series of events. And I'm just so grateful uh, to them uh, and to the rest of the administration for everything they're doing right now. A couple of questions did come up uh, that I wanted to ask you about. First of all, with respect to um, solid waste, we've also currently suspended bulky item pickup, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And with respect to um, yard waste pickup, I know that we've suspended that. Are we still charging that monthly fee right now? No, or they have suspended the monthly fee uh, and uh, I'm not aware of any concerns about that still being billed, but if anyone does, uh, receive that bill, please let us know. We'll make sure and try and figure that out. But as uh, it, it was our intention not to be billing that monthly fee. That's great. Thank you. That's what I thought. Um, uh, with respect to parks, the parks and rec department, specifically about our greenway trails and parks, um, have have you uh, has the de has the department received uh, a ton of feedback or any feedback really about uh, folks not exercising? appropriate social distancing in those spaces? Uh, I can speak anecdotally. I don't have uh, numbers about how many complaints have been received. I know that uh, they have received complaints uh, specifically. It, it has primarily seemed to be around athletic courts, which we have taken additional measures over the last uh, four or five days to both notify and then physically restrict those facilities where at all possible. Um, I can't speak to the volume of that. I know the city manager and the mayor and council have also received concerns that have been forwarded to myself and the department. So I would encourage people to continue to do that as well as to use the police non-emergency number that, that has been advertised as a place for people to make reports. We will, uh, when, when resources are available, I know we can dispatch officers to locations where people have concern. Uh, the officers can investigate and deal with that as appropriate. Um, this isn't, I don't, I'm not sure this is in your portfolio. I had a question about transportation. Um, well, I would hold that. Uh, yep. about transportation. Great. Uh, I'll save my, uh, my questions till then. Uh, thank you very much. Again, appreciate all the amazing work. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, are there any other questions? Sorry, I apologize. I was muting myself. I apologize. Councilmember Middleton, you're up. And I think Councilmember Caballero, did you also have a question? Okay. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I got nervous there for a minute seeing your mouth move and I couldn't hear it. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to keep my distance. Thank you. Thank you, you probably like it better that way when it doesn't come out. Nah, nah. <laughs> Good evening, colleagues, and to all watching. Um, but let me just add, um, and to the city manager and to the mayor, let me just add my 
uh, words of commendation and just utter respect uh, and awe at the job that the staff has been doing. Since the declaration of the state of emergency, this staff has borne uh, the brunt of the nuts and bolts of how this city keeps working uh, since the declaration. And, um, you know, it, these are these are challenging times, but but someone once said that the true test of character is taken during challenging times. Uh, and and this this city workforce, this municipal workforce, is just um, is making us all proud. Uh, I do want to ask about: uh, are, Do we have everything we need in terms of PPE, personal protection equipment for our frontline workers? And do we see any um, uh, issues on the horizon with making sure they have what they need uh, as they go into situations? I'll uh, I'll address that now, and uh, I think there may be some other folks uh, who could also contribute. The um, want to give a shout out to the great work done by our risk management division under Deputy City Manager Wanda Page. They have been closely tracking uh, the CDC guidelines on PPE uh, as it uh, existed at the beginning of this uh, event and as it has uh, evolved over the, the couple of weeks and continued to push out uh, immediate updates to departments as to what the CDC is recommending for PPE. At this time, we, uh, we have had all of the core basic protective equipment uh, that, that we need, uh, but we continue to track, uh, as many governments do, you know, the potential for shortages, uh, and we also are making sure that we have good guidance from risk on, on what is required and not, uh, not you know, participating in um, the exhaustion of those resources from the medical community who also needs those. So I am, at, as of today, not aware of any shortages in departments uh, working very closely with purchasing and risk to make sure we have the, the appropriate uh, uh, gear, but we will continue to, to track that. And there remains an area of concern as, as you've heard multiple reports about, uh, but we, we are not immediately in, in a dire situation with PPE. Good to hear, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're muted, Mr. Mayor. I'll say it again. Are there any more questions for Deputy City Manager Ferguson? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've been on a number of the calls with EOC folks over the last couple of weeks, and so I don't have a question, but I just wanted to add my voice to the chorus of appreciation and um, thanks for all of the work that the staff has been doing over the last couple of weeks. Um, being on those calls, it's been clear there's an incredible amount of work that's been happening and the collaboration between the city and the county and the public schools has been really strong. Um, I know that those are the kinds of collaborations that we need right now and they're they're saving lives you know, because we were able to act quickly and, um, and in cooperation with our other local governments, um, we are, more better able to fight this um, to fight this pandemic, and we see that in the evidence that Durham is um, is doing better than a lot of other communities in the country. And so, I just wanted to um, extend my appreciation as well to all of our city staff and um, staff from the other organizations that have been working so hard to give us um, to give us the the services that we need in this time, and to make sure that we're doing the absolute best we can to slow the spread of this disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, any other questions or comments for uh, Bo? Bo, I do have one thing that uh, Charlie's uh, comment, one of Charlie's questions made me. Uh, I have heard concerns about social distancing on the American Tobacco Trail. I've been on the American Tobacco Trail quite a lot uh, over the past couple of weeks. I haven't seen a lot of problems myself, but I have heard from other people I'm, I don't know what the let we have those great signs that we put into parks um, for social distancing. And I just it, we may uh, have enough of them on the trail, but I do want to just flag that that that's might something somebody might want to look at, especially with the ATT. The other trails that I've been on have not been as crowded, but um, that might be something you want to give some thought to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll follow up on that. Any other questions or comments for Bo? Both. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Freeman. Uh, well, I'll jump in. Uh, no questions, but thank you for your work. 
and I, I apologize. I have to use my cell phone. I know I'm a soft talker, so I just want to make sure that you can hear me. Okay. And just noting, I I do realize that the the differences for people that are unhoused um, have been raised as a question, and I just want to make sure that that is addressed. And I'm not sure if that's something Tom or Reginald want to address, or if it's Bo, but I just want to make sure that that is raised. We actually have a report on that a little bit later in the meeting. Um, we're going we're gonna to hear from community development on that important topic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, anything else for Bo? No, thank you. Thank you. We Mayor. really appreciate you. Mr. Mayor, I think it might be good to move to the transit piece now and have Sean Egan talk about that before we uh, have Chief Davis talk about enforcement. All right. Sean, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to come and speak about the important work that we're doing in transit here. So uh, during this event, across Durham, Go Durham Bus and Go Durham Access Paratransit continue to provide transit service for essential travel, enabling those who work at our hospitals, nursing homes, grocery stores, and pharmacies to continue to serve the Durham community while also providing travel for people to access critical goods and services during this emergency. Two weeks ago, we began using rear doors for boarding the buses while also suspending fare collection, making bus a free service for the essential employees caring for our community during this event. We also implemented new sanitation measures for both our vehicles and facilities. On our buses, interior passenger areas, and driver compartments are cleaned daily with Lysol. This includes seats, windows, floors, and handholds. Durham Station is being cleaned daily, and the platform is pressure washed, and workers are cleaning all door handles and knobs once an hour during operation with sanitizing wipes. We've modified Go Durham bus service to reduce the impact of this event on our employees who continue to work tirelessly for our community. Go Durham service now ends daily at 9.30 p.m and service frequency has been reduced on several routes, including the 4, 5K, 7, 10B, 11, 11B, and 20. With these changes, we continue to provide more than 80% of our regularly scheduled service. This enables us to avoid crowding and maintain social distancing on our services, where ridership remains at approximately two-thirds of normal levels. I would like to take a moment to recognize our employees. Go Durham operators and all of our frontline colleagues face the same pressures as everyone else right now. They have families, kids out of school, loved ones with health concerns, and many may know someone already impacted by COVID-19. Despite these pressures and despite understandable concerns, our workforce is showing up out of a sense of duty to our community. In recognition of the extraordinary work our bus and paratransit operators and the support staff who make our service possible, we are providing premium pay for our workforce during this event. A 5% pay increase is in line with the premium pay made available for city employees working in the field through this event. We are most grateful for the dedication and professionalism of Go Durham Bus and Access staff who make essential travel possible during this time. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Sean. We appreciate it so much. Um, I'm going to now ask if there are any questions for Sean. Uh, Council, Council Member Reese. Sean, thank you so much for that report. Um, I've been so impressed with the steps that Go Durham has taken uh, during this crazy time uh, to make sure that that backbone of reliable service remains in effect for the folks who need it. So many of the workers who have been deemed essential uh, by our stay-at-home orders uh, are uh, low-income workers who, who rely heavily on our bus service. And the fact that Go Durham has uh, remained largely up um, with a tremendous amount of uh, continued frequency uh, is impressive. Also impressive are the measures that the department took to, um, to create more separation between operators and passengers with respect to rear of the bus loading and of course going fare free. I wanna say my biggest praise though, as you did for our operators who are um, uh, just doing an incredible job right now 
operating that lifeline for our uh, our the employee the, the folks in Durham who need that bus service the most. And I just want to thank you for your leadership on that. Um, I had a question that was a little bit related to parks, but I wanted to ask it of um, of you, Sean. Um, one of the suggestions that I've heard a number of times over the last week or so is that in response to uh, what the mayor has heard, and I know I've heard it, although I have not seen it personally, and I know a number of us have heard, is overcrowding and lack of social distancing in some of our uh, parks and greenways. If the city of Durham would consider uh, closing any city streets in order to give folks more opportunities, more places uh, to be outside, to walk and to run um, other than the existing greenway uh, trail system. I wonder uh, what some of your thoughts about that. Sure, I mean, uh, um, as was mentioned earlier, we have had a number of um, citizens express their concerns about the American Tobacco Trail, for example, um, and crowding there. And what um, we're really focused on right now is getting the message out and supporting that message that uh, people should be um, taking trips only for essential travel um, and then also maintaining social distancing. So um, that of the places where we've heard reports, the tobacco trail is the, um, the uh, highest volume of reports that we've heard so far. Um, so we're, we'll be looking at additional measures that we can take to do that um, in terms of Closing roadways, there's not a clear um, roadway that runs parallel uh, that would be appropriate for closing for the tobacco trail, but uh, we'll continue to monitor areas where we see that. We've also made a series of changes uh, on our roadways for um, pick up and drop off zones for our restaurants, for example, for carry out. Um, and we're continuing to see uh, good utilization of that, but we haven't seen as much crowding on the roads themselves. So we'll continue to monitor that. Um, and as appropriate, we'll look at the example of some other cities have taken. Uh, we've been in discussions with our colleagues in the National Association of City Transportation officials uh, around the country, uh, and we're working closely about um, to monitor best practices and we'll implement them um, as, as appropriate here in Durham. Thanks, Sean. And you, you reminded me of one other thing I wanted to mention, then I'll be done, and that is uh, how grateful I am that the city uh, suspended the paid on street parking. Uh, during this period to provide some additional space for takeout parking for our downtown restaurants uh, and also opening the gates on the city owned parking decks. I think those are those are really important steps right now where we are. Um, hopefully, obviously, it has encouraged a lot of people to come downtown, um, except to pick up food, which has been great. Uh, I know a number of us have been through downtown uh, by car during this time, and it's, it's really um, it's really wild uh, to see what the city looks like in any event. Sean, I just wanted to thank you um, for everything that you've done. You've really uh, uh, been uh, put into the fire very quickly. Um, and I just want to say I'm really grateful to the way you've stepped up to the challenge and helped lead the department in this difficult time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Austin and then Council Member Middleton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, hi, Sean. Thank you for your work. Um, just uh, I, I understand the social distancing measures you're you know, trying to cultivate with the changes in the service and, you know, the reloading for the buses. Are folks who, who board the buses being asked to kind of self-regulate their social distancing or is there anything going on to separate passengers? So right now we're doing that with um, signage. We're also doing that with um, voice announcements on the buses, asking people to maintain um, that six feet of distance. Um, and then we put up um, signage uh, around our system uh, before people board as a reminder to do that. Um, so we're continuing to try to find creative ways to get that um, message out, but it, it's not something that we're asking staff to enforce. We're, uh, we're asking our riders um, to maintain that safe social distance. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think you're muted again, but you had already um... <laughs> recognize me. So I'll just Councilmember Middleton, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you work that out, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, thank you so much. I want to associate myself with uh, Council Reese's um, comments. I think he aptly uh, captures a, a, the characterization of how important transportation is and our ridership here in Durham. So I want to associate myself with his comments. I do have a specific uh, question. Um, I, I know we've observed um, in other cities around the country uh, that transportation, public transportation, oftentimes has been a challenge uh, 
for social distance just by virtue of volume. Obviously, we're not in New York. We don't have that type of ridership. Uh, but I think all of us were just struck if we didn't see that um, that Facebook post, that video of that operator, I think it was in Detroit, um, who posted this very, very um, um, uh, visceral appeal about someone that was coughing on the bus. And I'm just wondering if our operators, I think it's great that we're paying them at a premium, number one. Are our operators being provided with any type of PPE, mask or gloves or anything like that? And if not, do we have any plans to do that? So as Bo said, we're working very closely and monitoring the recommendations from the CDC um, and looking at um, regularly assessing the level of uh, risk of exposure, um, as well as um, the uh, equipment and uh, the recommendations. Uh, so right now, um, some of our operators um, may choose to, um, to wear um, a mask and gloves, uh, but we're not, um, we're not issuing masks at this point. Um, we'll continue to monitor that and, uh, as the situation develops and um, monitor the availability of equipment. Uh, but we're right now, we're allowing that uh, where the operators decide um, that they uh, want to bring that. So as we monitor is the only metric availability. I mean, we're not looking for any, anything else other than availability to decide whether or not we're going to issue them. Is that, is that fair? I think that the guidance is evolving, um, as Poe mentioned, from the um, CDC as well um, about how to uh, gauge the appropriate level of risk. So uh, we'll continue to work with our risk management division on that. Sure. Um, could you also address the paratransit uh, operators and the, the precautions we take there? Sure. So um, what we typically do is um, offer door-to-door um, -door service uh, for our uh, paratransit customers. What we're asking them now is to, um, is if possible to um, go curb to curb to try to limit the amount of um, contact or interaction between um, our operators and our riders on the service um, and to try to um, yeah, limit the amount of time and, and um, maintain as much as possible um, the appropriate distance um, our, our access paratransit riders uh, have disabilities that require additional assistance, um, but they also understand um, the risk um, and the concerns and the importance of social di distancing. So we've had a very good response from um, our access paratransit riders um, and they, they understand the importance of, of social distancing and are working with um, our staff to, to do everything they can to uh, maintain that. Now, I'm sure staff will check me, but I, I, I think the CDC just recently uh, uh, said that they advise Americans now to start wearing masks uh, uh, in public. I'm pretty sure that was the CDC, but I'm, I'm sure I'll be checked. I don't know how that will factor into our, our, um, our decision in terms of our operators on Go Durham, but, but I, I have no doubt that we will be proactive and we will be doggedly determined to, to do everything um, uh, to protect them as they do this vital work. They're keeping the city going. Uh, so thank you so much for, for the work you're doing under just incredible, incredible circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Other questions uh, for Sean? Council member Caballero. I just wanted a clarification. Are none of the, I understand the Durham operators for our regular services, but what about with the paratransit? I'm just thinking about the extra um, risks with our, some of our disabled. Uh, residents. So I don't. Well, I guess what I'm asking is, are there different standards for each system? So As there are. Yeah, there there are different um, there are different levels of interaction on the two systems. So I think as we move into um, uh, the PPE issue and, and making that, um, we'll have priority for our um, go Durham access staff. Thank you. Other questions for Sean? Sean, um, I do have one, um, just to, I, I think that the new um, CDC guidance, uh, which recommends people wearing masks, um, when they're basically when they're in six feet of someone else or think they might be or will be, uh, is important information for us. I, I um, 
I really am, I hope we, I would like to see our bus drivers wearing masks. Um, I, I think that that is the current guidance. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, I worry about them so much. I mean, we still have, I think, 14,000 boardings a day, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's, you know, I know not, not each boarding is one person, but, you know, thousands of people a day, that's a lot of people for our, our drivers to come to contact with. And so um, I just want to offer that. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just wanted to clarify that the CDC recommendation is for people to wear cloth masks in public, not the medical um, mask, N95 or, or surgical masks. They're asking that we um, reserve those for healthcare workers. There are some um, folks in Durham who have been sewing cloth masks for donation to the community, and I'm happy to um, get Sean and other folks at the city in touch with them um, to make sure that we can get some cloth masks for our employees. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilmember Caballero. Yeah, additionally, there is mixed. So the CDC did recommend facial masks, but there is one risk, which is that folks tend to touch their faces more because they're not used to wearing masks because they're not healthcare workers. So it's just a, a equipment they're not used to dealing with so that it has been one of the risks associated with it. So I just wanted to raise that as well. So if folks are wearing masks, just to be even more careful because you are more likely to touch your face. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And uh, Sean, thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thank you all for all your good work. We really appreciate it. All right, uh, Mr. Manager, who's next? Uh, I think next we ought to have uh, Chief Davis talk about the uh, police uh, response and enforcement, if that's okay. Great. Chief, welcome. You with us? There she is. Can you see Hello. me? Hello, Chief. Yes, we can. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, too. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide an update about patrol operations in the Durham Police Department during this current crisis. So I'll start with saying that, um, first of all, about three weeks ago, we began assessing our response to calls for service in light of the recent emergency orders related to COVID-19, which were initially enacted by the city and the state. In collaboration with the Durham 911 Emergency Communications Center, we have worked to establish new call taking protocols. The modifications allow for effective screening of all calls for service, dispatching only calls that require the presence of a DPD police officer and less serious offenses such as stolen property reports and incidents where a suspect is not on scene are handled by phone. Other COVID-19 information only calls are vetted by designated 911 call takers. And if appropriate, COVID-19 related calls that require an officer's response are dispatched to patrol. Durham One Call has also assisted with vetting information only calls and responding to citizen inquiries, hence avoiding the disruption of 911 emergency call taking. Also, a series of internal communications have been distributed to all patrol officers as a companion document to the state and local orders to guide our officers in the application of each order enacted by the governor, the city, or the county. As stay-at-home orders are amended, the Durham Police Department's internal guidelines are immediately updated to incorporate changes in our enforcement methods. Calls for service continue to be moderate and officers have been effective in utilizing distant verbal commands or public announcement systems, our PA systems that are in the vehicles to communicate with people violating any aspect of the stay at home orders. There have been no COVID-19 related violations that resulted in citations or enforcement action at this time. Officers have encountered only a few small crowds in the earlier stages of the first stay at home order about three weeks ago. However, over this past weekend, April, between April 2nd and the 5th, the Durham Police Re uh, Department responded to at least 
10 incidents of individuals congregating in groups of four or more to play basketball, soccer, or related sports, and a call related to a barbecue or cookout of sorts on a parking deck in the downtown area. Officers also responded to an incident where about 15 people congregated socially at a private residence. This call was originally dispatched as a noise complaint. And then once the officers responded, realized that there were several people at that particular location. In all cases, officers responded and reminded the congregants of the city state, the city's active stay at home order and compliance followed without incident. This weekend's calls were an obvious uptick in the number of people feeling the need to get outside, socialize, and return to normal. But while they may have felt their actions were innocuous, this type disregard of the city's stay-at-home order could ultimately have grave consequences. Officers responded to only a few calls where citizens reported businesses not in compliance due to the number of patrons at the business location. Upon arrival, officers reminded the violators of the active state and local orders impacting certain business operations, and then owners quickly complied. Our officers also have um, a letter with my signature uh, basically to provide to owners or businesses that are in non-compliance or violating the current stay-at-home orders. We have not had to issue those uh, letters at this time, but they've been updated recently and we are prepared to post those orders when necessary. Throughout this crisis, it is our priority to maintain a healthy workforce to continue the highest levels of response and service delivery to the community we are sworn to serve. However, we need our citizens to do their part in slowing the spread of COVID-19. We will continue to provide updates and pertinent public safety information through a myriad of social media streams to encourage everyone to stay at home. Ideally, through continuous communication and reminders, we hope to leverage voluntary compliance amongst the masses. Our message to the public at large is to exercise good judgment and comply with social distancing and that we should all be ambassadors for ensuring compliance of the existing stay at home orders so that we can all return to normalcy in a very, very short order. Um, I don't have anything else. I do want to um, thank the administration also for recognizing essential employees with um, premium pay and um, additional leave. I think it meant a lot to our uh, frontline officers and uh, they are very, very grateful for that consideration also want to thank our officers while I have this opportunity because they, the men and women of Durham Police Department remain out there on the front lines. They have been unwavering, they have been committed, and, and to some degree heroic to continue to work without complaining. And um, I really, really do appreciate them and honored to lead the Durham Police Department. Thank you, Mayor Shul. Chief, thank you so much for a great report. Um, I've been really worried and along with our bus drivers and others, I've been very worried about our police officers, especially reading about some other cities. Um, the number of police officers in Detroit that have come down with COVID-19 or been quarantined, the enormous number of officers in New York. And I'm hoping that because, um, you know, you got started early and we got started early uh, with the training and the, the distancing that we can protect our officers, uh, but it, it, it's been on my mind a lot. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that I know our officers are out there. I'm very appreciative of them. They are appreciative of you too. Um, so council members, uh, questions for Chief Davis. Council member Reese. Uh, hi, Chief Davis. Uh, thank you for uh, a great report. Um, I just wanted to say how grateful I am to you for your leadership of the department really this unprecedented time in our history yes. um i've been following along with our with the daily incident reports and seeing the staffing levels where they are is a testament to the type of people that are employed by the durham police department in your leadership and so uh, i just want to second what you said about um our patrol officers who are out there every day 
Um, I also wanted to thank you uh, on Friday afternoon, you posted um, a really fantastic uh, post on Facebook about how the stay at home orders are gonna be enforced in the city of Durham. Yes. Um, you identified uh, three things. The, the first of which was the very first question I got from someone on social media about the stay at home order, which is, are people gonna get pulled over and asked right. to show their papers? Right. Um, show me, so, show some kind of certificate that, um, that they're allowed to be out driving. And what I said then is amazingly enough, exactly what you said is that that's it's not good. a reasonable and articulable suspicion to engage in a traffic stop. Right. Um, and so I just wanted to thank you for that uh, and for the really uh, solid way that the department has operated during this, this, this wild period in our city's history. Um, I did wanna ask one question about, uh, related to the question that was asked about bus drivers. What is the current protocol for our officers in terms of um, wearing masks when they engage with members of the public? Well, you know, on the national stage and recommendations initially were sort of, um, like, you know, um, misleading in a sense, uh, because I even agree. some of the, the, the professionals, uh, the researchers and all of the folks that we depend on to give us good advice have sort of shifted gears in what we should and shouldn't do. And once the um, message came that an asymptomatic person should be wearing a mask, um, we began making sure that all of our officers, we started early making sure that all of our officers had PPE so that they could put masks on when they needed to in response. But now they are wearing their masks during any type of encounter with the public. Um, we've had some recent incidents where um, officers had to to uh, wear masks where they were just basically responding to a noise complaint or something of that nature. But we have instructed them to keep their distance. And even though um, it seems to be a little bit um, impersonal to be 15 feet away from a caller, uh, and unfortunately, and talking from the car, uh, we have instructed our officers to use the PA systems and do everything that they can to communicate, be diplomatic in their communication, and hopefully people will understand what that distance is really all about. That's great to hear. Um, I didn't have anything else I wanted to say except to say again, thank you for everything. That Facebook post was awesome. I'm just well, saying so thank you for doing that. Thank you. Sorry, every time Mark Anthony wants to speak, I mute myself. Mark Anthony, <laughs> how's Member Milton? I won't read too much into that. <laughs> <laughs> Chief, thank you so much. Um, I, I, we're finding out here in Durham, sure enough, what the country already knew about you, uh, <laughs> about the level thank of leadership. Uh, yeah. No, I mean that, that you bring to the job. And unfortunately, sometimes the, the better parts of leaders don't show up until times of, times of challenge and controversy, right. as Dr. King said. And, and we are certainly benefiting from um, all that you bring as a leader. And, and I'm glad to hear uh, the conversation about PPN. This is something I've, I've, you know, I'm going to stay on, and not only with the, the bus drivers and, and yeah. frontline workers, but the police department in particular. Something that really struck me, there are more New York City police officers that have contracted this virus than the size of our police force. That's right. And that, just, just let that be marinate on that for a minute. Yeah. And it, it, it would be a nightmare scenario for our department to to have this thing just run through it and the, and the ranks of it. So I just want to lean in and, and just one thank you um, for 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 all that you're doing in this time of crisis and just again lean in on uh, letting us know um, anything you need in terms of PPE and making sure that our our departments and frontline workers have uh, what they need uh, to keep them protected as they do their job. I want to ask you uh, quickly ha ha without. Um, compromising any operational security or anything. Are there any uh, enforcement posture changes or priorities that have been, um, um, again, without, if, if, if it goes into operational security, don't, don't answer me, uh, but, yeah. but are, are, are there enforcement um, priorities that have been uh, outlined that would make it less likely that they would have to come into contact with the public unnecessarily? Well, you know, one thing we keep reiterating to our officers is that there will be no call that won't be dealt with. We will absolutely respond to every call, whether it's by phone or in person. 
So what we've tried to do is sort of um, um, set up a strategy so that officers did not have to have encounters of individuals um, who just simply want a police report. So it shifted out the manner in which we're responding but the, the actual volume of our calls, we're still, we're still receiving about the normal range of calls uh, for service. The, the calls have changed um, just slightly, but officers' interactions and the manner in which they um, address various types, even criminal activity, is different. And um, the level of communication is, is, um, is, is probably greater than it has been in the past. Uh, basically to uh, try to mitigate a situation without making an arrest, if at all possible. Uh, write citations, if, if that's the best way to resolve an issue. Uh, unfortunately, we, we're still the police and uh, we've still had some incidents that we've had to respond to. But my priority and my concern is the health of the organization so that they can continue to respond to the citizens of Durham and um, wanting to make sure that they stay healthy and their families stay healthy and, and, and none of that is compromised in their work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Chief. Thank, Thank you, Council Thank Member. You. Any other questions for uh, uh, Council Member Austin? Uh, and then, uh, good evening, and Chief. then Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I don't have any questions. I just wanna kind of echo my colleagues and their gratitude um, just share, you know, we have some family that live outside the United States and um, they live in an area where, you know, many of the folks in their neighborhood and people that they know uh, have just left kind of with their lights on, they've left everything in their homes, left their pets um, and just fled, um, not necessarily because of COVID, fear of COVID-19, but because of fear of how we would be enforced, how orders would be enforced. Um, and so I just want to kind of again echo my colleagues and appreciate your work and your leadership uh, and how you've responded uh, to this crisis. So thank you so much for your work and I appreciate you. Thank you, best wishes to you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chief, thank you uh, for your work. I just wanted to also um, appreciate you and your leadership during this crisis and all the work that um, your staff are doing and especially your uh, enforcement priorities, um, making sure that we're getting compliance uh, without using, you know, the sort of punitive measures that I think um, folks in our community have been concerned about. So I want to appreciate that approach um, from you. And also just to bring into the conversation that our county jail has been working really hard to reduce the population in the jail so that they can um, do social distancing, uh, releasing folks um, as much as possible pre-trial and letting people who have any sort of medical complications um, out of jail. And so I uh, just also want to appreciate any work that we can do as a police department to make sure that, you know, during this time, the option that we, you know, are not increasing the jail population by, you know, by putting people in there who don't necessarily need to be in there. And I know that that's what we try to do all the time. I feel like this crisis has kind of heightened a lot of our existing priorities around, you know, transit being affordable and, um, mm -hmm you know, people having access to, to green space, as well as those, you know, public safety priorities that we're dealing with those issues as much as possible without um, without sending people to, to be in a situation where they'd be less safe in a congregate living situation like the jail. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Council Member Reese. I said something and then someone said something and I remembered it. Chief. As you know, North Carolina has a very odd law about not wearing masks in public. And I've had more than one person reach out to me and say, you know what, I know that the, recently, I know that the CDC guidance has changed and encourages folks to, to wear masks when they're out in public, but, I, you know, I'm not comfortable doing that. Um, right. There's two black men who approached me and said, I, I, or, how, do I, how do I navigate this situation? So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you think your officers are going to handle those situations during this time when a lot more people are going to be wearing masks. Well, um, I think my response would be during a time that we're all dealing with a pandemic, a person wearing a mask doesn't stand out as, as being, you know, a person that's suspect. 
um, or anything like that. I really don't think it's on the frontal lobe of my officer's thoughts right now. Everybody's wearing masks and we want them to be, to, uh, be able to protect themselves and protect the public. So um, I don't think that, that that issue has raised a concern with us just yet. Um, I think that our officers too have a, a, a pretty good intuition about um, individuals that, um, you know, are basically wearing a Snoopy mask, um, you know, or some printed kind of material on their face to protect themselves. We're seeing a lot of that. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't run into that as an issue just yet, but uh, I guess um, individuals who have felt some type of apprehension about that in the past may be a little bit concerned, but that might be another uh, tweet that I might have to send out in response to frequently asked questions. Can I wear a mask to protect myself? Absolutely. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that clarity. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Just wanted to um, thank Councilman Brees for bringing that up. It's also something that's been on my mind and something that I think our General Assembly delegation should bring um, to, to the governor. And as we have one of the soon to be newest members of our general assembly delegation here. Uh, wanted to um, make sure council member Austin had that on the, on her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to note that I very much enjoyed seeing uh, one of Charlie's kids run in here and give him a hug. That doesn't happen a lot at council meetings. So it's that was a very- It's bedtime, so, you know. Got to do yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, Chief, thank you. Thank we appreciate you. you. Thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, let us know how to support you. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, Mr. Manager, who's up next? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought it might be good now to transition to hear from Colin Davis, who's leading the task force at the EOC on homelessness. Great. There have been a lot of questions about that, and hopefully Colin uh, can answer most of those for you. Thank you. Good afternoon, or evening, I guess. Good uh, evening, Colin. Mayor and Council. So, as you know, we are working diligently to take care of our community members who are experiencing homelessness at the same time we are handling a COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis. We've been looking at various ways of resolving numerous issues. because We have to look at the homeless population as really several distinct groups. We've got an unsheltered homeless population, a sheltered population of people who are homeless, and then another group of people who are being exited from jails, prisons, hospitals who have nowhere to go that would ordinarily go into a shelter system. And then within each of those subpopulations, we've got healthy people, we've got people who may be symptomatic, we may have people who are uh, testing positive for COVID-19, and then we've got another group who are medically vulnerable. And those are the people who are defined by CDC guidelines as more vulnerable to negative outcomes of this virus. So the EOC, uh, the team in the EOC has been looking at how to handle all these various things. As you're aware, our shelters in Durham are predominantly congregate living facilities. Some have a few private bedrooms, but they still share congregate kitchens where everybody comes together and cooks or you've got a whole bunch of bedrooms in a very close quarters. So we have been working through trying to reduce the number of people in our congregate shelters to achieve social distancing. We have been in the process of trying to set up uh, hotels to be able to further create that self-quarantining self-isolation to create that distance and allow people the space they need to prevent illness and also have a place for people who are being discharged for medical care to 
come back to somewhere where they they'll have a place to recover should they not be sick enough to remain hospitalized. So as we continue to work through this, we're working with the food task force to figure out feeding, figure out how to get the hotels online and how to staff the hotels to ensure we've got adequate safety measures to take care of, take care of the community as best we can. With that said, there will probably be some people who will remain unsheltered during this, during this process. Whether we, we like that or not, that's just a fact of the matter <clears throat> as we work through the coordinated entry process to achieve uh, social distancings that are required. So at this point, we're, we're hoping to start moving some people tomorrow. The procurement of hotel rooms has taken a lot longer than we ever anticipated. So this is kind of where we are now is have, we have a plan in place. We're working to execute the plan and hope to be rolling shortly. And we have moved about a dozen people who are considered the most medically vulnerable out of the, out of one of the congregate shelters to a local establishment, a uh, local hotel that is able to accommodate them with appropriate social distancing so that they won't get sick. Our hope is to prevent as many people from getting sick as possible. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, Colin, I have a question in terms, thank you for your work. I know you've done a great job and I've been following this and Mayor Pro Tem has been on the, um, on the twice weekly calls concerning uh, the, the work that everyone's doing around homelessness has been a major, amazing. I was on one of those calls and have been keeping up with it. It's an amazing, uh, it's amazing work. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, and I, uh, I had my, been my understanding, uh, not from discussion with you, but from a discussion with another member of the EOC, that we were going to try to be moving people uh, out of uh, urban ministries and to actually empty urban ministries to get people so adequate socially distanced and into the hotels this week. And then now I've heard today and it's you've confirmed that uh, we're not going to be able to do that. And and I know that part of the part of the understanding is that the county has to sign a vote on this contract uh, and that that's uh, one of the things that's holding us up. And uh, I've I've asked that uh, they have a special meeting as soon as possible to vote on this contract so that we can get people moved. When I think about our vulnerabilities as a community to COVID-19, there are several areas that I'm particularly worried about. We've talked about, for example, our, our transit system, people clustering on buses. I'm, I'm very concerned about our construction sites. I'm, I'm concerned about our utility crews. I'm, but nothing is am I as concerned about as I am about the many uh, medically vulnerable people uh, who are uh, in our uh, in our shelters. Uh, and so um, assuming the the county could speed up its approval process and get this done this week uh, in terms of the contract with a hotel, how fast are we ready to move once we have a contract in place? Uh, to get people uh, out of a situation where they're not able to socially distance and into the hotels. Great question, Mayor. The process, I've been talking and working with the executive directors of the two shelters in the city, and they've been working on logistics and assigning rooms, and we'll be ready to rock and roll pretty quickly as soon as that contract's executed, possibly the same day. I believe is possible, depending on, I don't know dates or when approvals would happen. And I know that Drew, Drew Cummings and I and the EOC, we're all looking at ways to expedite things and try to find ways to move this through as quickly as possible because all of us are sitting here looking at a potential, you know, high risk situation where one person in a congregate place gets sick yeah. and how quickly could 70 people all of a sudden be sick at the same time and possibly overwhelm 
a medical system. And none of us want that to happen. So we are pushing as hard as we can. And I believe that as soon as that document's ready, I think we can be ready to go. And have been working with um, Sean's group with transportation and working with Go Triangle to arrange logistics for that. So there's a lot of logistics that we've been working on as we work through this. And every time we come up with a solution and a plan, there seems to be a new question that comes up that needs to be addressed and answered and worked through to make sure that everybody's works well. So we are moving as quickly as we can with as best diligence as we can to make this happen. Thank you. Well, I hope the county will expedite its process. I, again, I, I think this is really at the top of our list. And uh, somebody mentioned, I think uh, maybe uh, uh, Councilmember Reese, that Sean Egan had been uh, thrown into the fire pretty fast. You have too, Colin. Uh, you haven't been here very long, and now you're dealing with something unprecedented. So I want to thank you for all the leadership that you're showing and appreciate you being uh, at the emergency, op running that for the Emergency Operations Center. Thank you. I want to ask now if, uh, if Council Member Freeman, uh, she had asked a question about this earlier, and she may want to have another question at this time. Councilmember Freeman, do you have any questions? Okay, maybe not. So anyone else with questions at this time for Colin? Councilmember Middleton and then Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Colin. Welcome. <laughs> you get to the good part now. Thank you. Um, there I am. I, I, I just wanted to... Um, be clear, and the mayor kind of provided an on-ramp for, for my question, that the when the obstacles you talked about regarding the hotel room, is it plural or is it the only obstacle just the county acting on a contract? I want to make certain that we're not signaling that there's reticence on the part of hotel operators or, or anything of that nature, or is there? No, I, I, think, I think there's challenges when you're working through a contract of moving this many people and figuring out terms that will work that are amenable to both sides. And I will say the team worked, uh, we, we made some decisions Friday, we worked all weekend on getting a contract put together. And I think we have terms agreed to this afternoon. That's pretty fast for zero, zero to a full, full contract ready to roll, I think. And we are trying to work through that. I think when we're looking at additional hotels, Hotels rightfully are saying, you know, if you're going to move people who are potentially sick to our facility, we really want to make sure you're taking over an entire wing or enough of the building because we really don't want to have a group of people who are sick or potentially sick commingling with another group of people who are healthy. That sort of defeats the purpose. So we're looking through all these different pieces of the puzzle while trying to ensure we keep the process moving. Right. So is it safe to say that those issues, we are now at a point where enough of those issues have been worked out and there is a contract pending. We're just awaiting action on the part of our colleagues at the county. Or are they still working those issues out? I believe I believe all the issues of the contract language and terms were were worked out today. I'll have to double check. I was in I was in a meeting and then had to leave that to jump on several other meetings. Right. I believe when Good. Drew was finishing those discussions with the hotel lawyers and their team and the county uh, finance and lawyer team, but I believe they got to a point that they've got something ready, ready that everybody can sign off on. Absolutely. Listen, I know you've got a lot of balls in the air. A absolutely. Uh, keep us posted. Thank you so much. Bob. Oh, absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Reese, did you have your hand up for a question? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, welcome aboard, Colin. Uh, nice to see you in this context um and thanks i've been reading uh the reports and, and i've been following along with your work um during this crisis and i just want to thank you for the frankly just the energy that you've poured into trying to take care of our neighbors um who currently don't have a place to live it's it's obviously something that's very important to the council when they are singled out um <coughs> excuse me singled out these folks in his original stay-at-home declaration as much as in need of 
support from all of our local governments. Um, and I'm proud of the work that you're doing to make that happen. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, with respect to our uh, population, uh, our neighbors who are currently experiencing homelessness, what, for the most part, what is their um, health care situation? How are they receiving care um, right now? Most of their health care is done through some of the nonprofit health care for the homeless providers. Uh, Lincoln Healthcare does a lot of their health care. I believe Samaritan Health does some. There's probably a few others that I'm forgetting. I'm still new to the area, so I don't know all the homeless health care providers, but those are the two. Um, Alliance is helping with the behavioral health care uh, portion of this as well. Okay, and is that one of the things that um, the current effort is doing is in case there, those connections, those linkages aren't there on an individual basis, are we helping get those folks hooked up with appropriate health care services at this, right now? Yes, that's part of the homeless, not, the homeless service providers are working on that. One other question I had um, has to do with um, the Durham Rescue Mission. Do we know what uh, kind of social distancing practices, um, masks, gloves, PPE, what are, what, what's happening at the rescue mission right now? I don't know definitively. I know health department has been reaching out and working with them on social distancing and checking in to make sure they're following best practices. Other than that, that'd be a better question answered by the health department at this point. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is I'm, I'm almost certain that Council Member Freeman is having some kind of technical difficulty down there. Um, can you give us a nod or a thumbs up or something, Council Member, so we know, like, is, is did you want to ask a question? And, but I'm all done. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. And I was sort of thinking the same thing. Um, she want to use her chat box? Maybe she uses her chat box and then ask the Oh, question. yeah. Council Member Freeman, do you want to use your chat box? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, good. Go ahead. I specifically, I think um, two of my questions were asked, and I appreciate that from my council colleagues. Uh, and, uh, and around that congregate living facility um, situation, I also want to make sure that um, I do want to find out if there's a report coming on the assisted living and other facilities as well in the city. Uh, and then it would it would be nice to know what the coordination is with the health um, the health department on the homeless shelters that are in city limits because um, there's no update that's in, there's, it's not included in our current like sit reports when we receive them and so I just want to make sure that I bring that up and then on the ho hotel procurement side I didn't know if there were any other RFPs or procurement op opportunities that were made available but I do want to make sure that we're not forgetting to keep our equity in mind and and reaching out to facilities and organizations that may not be normally reached out to and um, just just keeping that all um, at the forefront. Sure. Um, thank you, Council Member. Uh, I, I want to make a couple of uh, comments about that. Those are important questions. Um, and I think it would be good and I'll just flag for uh, the city manager if we could get uh, some information from the EOC or, you know, just just a very short uh, written information about how they're dealing with the congregate sites, the uh, and not just the homeless shelters, but uh, the uh, assisted living facilities and so forth. This was mentioned on the on the the call tonight, uh, but I think that what Councilmember Freeman was asking about, I think, is on a lot of people's minds. It's not just homeless shelters. It's everywhere when we have group living. And there's a lot of good work being done around that, but I think it'd be good to hear a report on. I know Colin's work is specifically around the homeless shelters. And I also want to mention that um, I've been concerned about uh, also, in, in addition to urban ministries and families moving forward, uh, the Durham Rescue Mission. And um, so um, we have, they're not uh, members of the continuum of care uh, but I know that the health department, and I've been asking about this on our calls, the health department has been, uh, the health department has been uh, reaching out to them around uh, best practices. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that uh, that's all taking hold. And I'm, I'm, I'm planning to be more in touch myself with 
the folks at the rescue mission to talk about uh, how they're doing and uh, with our social distancing practices. But Colin, do you have anything to add about the rescue mission? Sure, we've, we've been talking to them and I know that some of our nonprofits have been in contact with them and talking about how to utilize space. And I believe that rescue mission has several congregate facilities but they also have several properties where they're able to achieve some um, self-quarantining for folks. At this point, the if, if one were to fully empty their congregate shelter into a hotel, it would be a monumental task and an extreme expense. So we're trying to use, you know, what they have available within their, within their purview. And the thought is, um, we'll get another hotel for those who are exiting the medical system, who are sick, who might not be able to go back to rescue mission. So they would land in that place until they were healthy enough to go back to rescue. Are you in pretty good contact with them? I have not had time to, but I know uh, Julia with- Julia Gamble? Yes, has been mm -hmm. talking to them and we're planning to reach out to them. All right, thank you. And also, in, uh, in just to, one of the things about the feeding that's going on, just to comment on one of the questions that uh, Councilmember Freeman had, I know that people are very much uh, uh, reaching out to uh, minority caterers uh, and restaurants to try to fill the feeding need, which I think is very important. I know there's a lot of attention to that from Durham Public Schools Foundation and from the folks who are thinking about how to feed our homeless population as well. And agree that's really important. Any other questions or comments for Colin? Just specifically around the question of what the coordination looks like from the city and the in the county. Is there a weekly call? Is there like a a daily rundown? Are you getting a report? How's that working? For for me, getting a report. Yeah, Colin. Okay, so I actually go to work every day in the EOC. So I'm a city employee working out of the EOC with all the county emergency response. So when I've got health concern questions, I can walk you know, a couple tables over and stand six feet away and talk to health department officials and say, what's your guidance on this? Here's what we're thinking of doing for a housing for this group of people. Is this going to create more problems than it solves or will this work? And brainstorm through those pieces. Uh, generally speaking, at the end of every day, I send an email to uh, Karen Lotto and Reginald uh, Johnson to update them on, on issues that may be of concern that would get raised to, uh, to Mr. Chadwell and ultimately to Mr. Bonfield. A lot of conversations back and forth. Thank you. Is there anyone else with questions for Colin? Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here and we appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to help. All right. I believe, Tom, that we have uh, we have a presentation from uh, Andre Pettigrew and one from Bertha Johnson. Are those our last two? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. And, and I don't know that I'd characterize them as presentations. <laughs> right. Uh, maybe uh, maybe updates. Uh, around particularly the, the next, the uh, small business uh, discussions that are going on. Yeah. They're in very preliminary stages, but I know it's uh, at the top of mind uh, for a lot of folks. So uh, Andre, if you're uh, connected, could you uh, jump in and, and give the council an update? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Welcome, Andre. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Tom. Andre Pettigrew, Director of the Office of Economic Workforce Development. I just want to give you a quick overview of the activities that the city has been involved in through the Office of Economic Workforce Development uh, in support of uh, the recovery and the resiliency of our business community. Um, uh, again, this is going to be a long challenge, but I'm happy with where we are today uh, as we try to support uh, our residents as well as our businesses to access the information and the resources uh, that have come about through the federal le CARES legislation. Uh, it's critical uh, from where I stand that we ensure uh, that our businesses are 
informed with the right information in a timely and accurate way. Uh, we uh, have accomplished this by essentially working with uh, a number of our partners and stakeholders. Uh, we're one of the organizing members of the Small Business Advisory Council and Coalition. Uh, this is a group of stakeholders who provide either technical assistance, financing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in fact, um, we have modeled this response uh, after the response that we created, uh, you know, responding to the Brightleaf uh, explosion. Uh, these are a group of providers, uh, including workforce providers that have worked together to be responsive to employees as well as business owners. Uh, they include the Small Business Development Center at Durham Tech, uh, the Small Business Technology Center that's a part of uh, NCCU, uh, the Institute's Women's Center, um, the Greater Durham Chamber, uh, the Greater Durham Black Chamber, uh, as well as Downtown uh, Durham Inc. Uh, we meet uh, three times a week, uh, virtually, uh, to ensure that we are updated uh, with the most current information on the various programs that are available and being sponsored through the SBA. Uh, we have hosted a number of webinars uh, to support uh, our community. These webinars are, again, critical uh, because, uh, again, the new legislation uh, is fairly complicated. There are a number of moving pieces, and much of that work is, is actually, uh, those resources are going to be delivered through our banks and through our certified development financial institutions. Um, we've identified a number of issues and tried to resolve them. Uh, one of the issues uh, really has to do with how do we prepare uh, members of our community who are either very small businesses or independent contractors who may not have all of the information that's required uh, to submit their application to the SBA uh, to qualify for these services. And again, that technical assistance, again, has to be delivered remotely. Uh, that's why the seminars are, are uh, such an important part of our work. Um, other city agencies who are joining OEWD as a part of this includes uh, the Department of Equity and Inclusion. Deborah Giles organization is one of the resources and again, working uh, with us uh, to ensure uh, that our hub companies and organizations are receiving services and the Durham Workforce Development Board is there uh, because again, uh, as these businesses have had to shut down, their employees have been laid off and getting access to workforce development services are important. Uh, we have tried to sort of make sure uh, that the information was readily available. Uh, on the city's homepage, uh, we have a tab uh, uh, very prominently displaying both the resources uh, that are needed for the unemployment insurance, uh, as well as small business uh, uh, resources through the SBA. Uh, we have created a new portal, uh, OEWD. We have been working on a new website, and I want to direct uh, you to um, uh, a new website that uh, we have posted, it's a portal uh, that provides a comprehensive set of resources and information for uh, our community. It's called durhambusiness360.com. That's durhambusiness360.com. That site is up uh, and, and activated. Uh, we'll be uh, doing a push email to make more of our community aware of it. Uh, it's been specifically designed to highlight the set of resources uh, available, uh, everything from applying for the various SBA packages, but also how to run your business consistent uh, with the stay at home orders and uh, things of that nature. So again, trying to become a resource uh, relative to all this is really important. Uh, the $380 billion that are a part of the CARES program uh, are resources that include loans, uh, forgivable loans and grants that are essentially flowing through banks and certified development corporations and technical assistance is being provided through small business development centers and small business technology centers. Again, all of these programs essentially have been overrun with applications. Uh, the SBA program, the payroll protection program, 
uh, was just started taking applications on Friday. Uh, there was a bit of confusion uh, on Friday because some banks were prepared to take applications, others were not uh, seeking you know, more direct information. However, I understand that uh, on Friday, uh, there were uh, between three to $5 billion of applications that were received uh, during this program. And so uh, again, we still are working with the banks to sort of make sure that there's consistent information, uh, more importantly, accurate information for folks to uh, file. Um, again, let me maybe move over from small business to talk a little bit about the, the work that we're doing uh, at the NC uh, Works Career Center. Uh, the NC Works Career Center is actually closed to the public. All of the career centers uh, in the state are closed to the public and uh, they are working virtually. So the focus clearly is uh, on the spike of uh, folks who have been laid off uh, who are now eligible for unemployment. Um, the, uh, the, the uh, Division of Employment Security, uh, which is a part of the state, manages the UI program, the uninsured program. The Division of Workforce Solutions, are there are partners in managing the career centers. All of the Division of Workforce Solutions staff have now been deployed to support the processing of UI claims. Uh, again, uh, the websites have crashed. Uh, there's been difficulty re reaching people uh, on, online or, or by the telephone. The best way is to get these resources via uh, the uh, uh, via the uh, online uh, website at ncworks.gov. So let me uh, maybe end there and maybe take some questions um, uh, uh, that you might have. Thank you very much, Andre. Colleagues, questions of Council Member Freeman. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that information, Andre uh, Pettigrew. The Business support uh, that you mentioned, the council and coalition, is there any um, uh, Hispanic, there's a Hispanic um, business association in Durham and is also the Durham professional business chain. Are they both included in that conversation? Uh, we have not included uh, the Hispanic group. Again, that's a, a group that we need to sort of rope in uh, and happy to you know, get that contact information to include them uh, in our meeting. Uh, the Durham Business Chain, um, I think, is has been on the list, but I don't think uh, they've been on the calls that we have. Uh, again, we'll we'll reach out. Uh, we're trying to include as many people uh, on this call uh, and connect folks to it. So uh, again, we will look to add uh, representatives from both of those groups. And then I just wanted to, to repeat, you said the DurhamBusiness360.com was going to be for specifically the SBA payroll pr protection, or is it no. something separate? Uh, no, the DurhamBusiness360.com uh, uh, website is uh, the OEWD website that's been repurposed to feature the full range of support services uh, that small businesses can access uh, in regard to COVID-19. It does include information uh, around the SBA programs, but it includes both state and other programs that are out in, in the marketplace. And then, then I just uh, want to, well, two more, and I'll let my other colleagues come, along, come in. Um, specific to NC Works and the Division of, of uh, Workforce Solutions. So for people without internet access or computers, if the phone, if there's a phone number or email address, can you is that available on that same website or is there a different website? Sure, uh, you can get to this information, but the most direct way to get the both phone number as well as the website uh, for all of the NC Work Centers is ncworks.gov. ncworks.gov. Okay, and do you have like any handouts that might be available? Um, I've had a few small business owners uh, reach out to me in regards to trying to figure out how they're going to manage, and especially uh, folks who are uh, con contractors, so really small businesses of one or two, mm -hmm. uh, just trying to figure out how to be supportive. 
um, as so, they may have had to cut internet access. Right. Um, a, because of the social distancing policy, uh, all of the partners are working remotely. And so um, the information, much of it is PDF available. In other words, you could print that off, but um, we do not have uh, a, uh, you know, some physical handouts at this time. We, we did not design this program uh, based on that. But again, I will bring this issue back to the group and let's see how we might be able to, to do it and where we might be able to post and display the information. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pastor. Council Member Caballero. Yeah, um, just to follow up, so the Hispanic Chamber Association would probably be the best one, and that's regional, it's not Durham-based. Um, questions I have is what kind of, with the webinars and the outreach, what kind of multilingual resources are you putting out there? What, what type of webinars are you doing in Spanish and other high use languages? We know that, um, our immigrant owned businesses are struggling. A lot of them aren't gonna act, be able to access the same resources in the same way or don't know how to do it. So they're, they're you know, lacking um, language and cultural, um, or I, I guess they have cultural and language barriers. And so just wanna make sure that we're actually being, we're getting ahead of it and not just reacting to it. And then um, additionally, I know that the, um, LCCU, the Latina Cooperativa, is not actually doing the SBA loans, which would be one of the kind of go-to for us in Durham. Um, and I have resources that they shared with me about where they suggested that Hispanic uh, business owners go to. I'm happy to share that with you, but um, yeah. I know that there's a huge need. I know a lot of folks have questions and I know quite frankly, there's a lot of panic right now. Right. Um, so in terms of uh, the Spanish translation, uh, met with NIS, Constant Stanso in their group, uh, they're assisting us to do uh, some of the Spanish translation for some of the content that we've developed. Um, again, we're behind there. Uh, all of the workshops, the webinars that have been done have been done in English and of course they're posted uh, and happy to use this channel to create a Spanish version of uh, any and all of the seminars. Uh, that is an opportunity that we think are really critical to supporting uh, the Latinx community. Uh, and I think we can, can respond to this fairly quickly. So again, uh, would love to reach out with you directly to uh, again, get some details and get them engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you, Andre, for all your work. I have a question about the workforce development side. I know part of the CARES Act um, is an extra $600 of unemployment insurance and that folks who aren't covered by North Carolina's unemployment insurance policies like the um, like gig workers and self-employed folks are eligible for the federal support. Um, but you mentioned that all of the NC Works sites are now operating remotely. So I'm wondering what we can do to make sure that any laid off um, workers in Durham or part-time folks who have seen their hours reduced or gig workers or self-employed workers who are now covered, who might not have this information um, about the new benefits, how we can help get that information out to our residents. Right. Um, again, uh, we need your help to help us get the word out. Uh, our strategy has been primarily remote. Uh, again, the city's website, uh, the banner page has uh, had this information posted fairly prominently and so citizens can go there and get a lot of information. Uh, the Durham Business 360 website actually has specific information uh, for small independent contractors. One of the issues that we've identified is that there are a number of people who in the past would not have been eligible for unemployment, but they now are eligible. And, and again, the gig workers, uh, the sole proprietorships, uh, the independent work. We're, we're, we, we talk a lot about the hairdressers and the barber shops. Uh, these people are now eligible. And part of this in terms of working through this network is getting the word out. And the websites are uh, an ability for people to self-serve. Uh, again, if you spend some time on that on, on our new website, you'll see that a lot of the information is there. Uh, 
uh, we'll be sending a press release out tomorrow uh, promoting uh, this new website to get the word out as a, again, source of information uh, for our community and all of our residents. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, could someone in your office um, or somewhat make a, like an infographic or something that we could use uh, to promote, to send out, um, that would be helpful we, in like okay. out to folks, thank you. All right. Um, other questions for Andre? Uh, Andre, I just, a, a couple things I wanted to add. Thank you so much for all you're doing. Um, the, um, so colleagues, uh, as I think all of you all are aware, Duke University is putting a um, million dollars towards, of their $5 million towards the work of uh, supporting our small businesses. And they are very, uh, they want other corporations to pitch into this fund, this, uh, the, uh, the uh, fund that they're setting up. And they very much want uh, both Durham city and county to pitch in as well. Uh, and uh, I've talked briefly about this to Tom. Uh, Andre, I've been on uh, the, uh, one of the calls with uh, Andre and Keith. Um, uh, actually, I guess Duke wasn't on that call, but I've had discussions with Stephanie Williams. And so I think this is something that we're gonna need to be thinking about. What, uh, in the call with self-help, what we talked about uh, with Andre and Keith and, and a couple of people from self-help is that city funds, uh, should we choose to allocate them, which I believe we should, um, would be particularly geared towards, uh, so, so well, let me step back a second. A the funds that are available from the, uh, from the CARES Act are not available to undocumented people. So one of, the, one of the most important gaps that we'll have to fill is so many small businesses of, with undocumented people, uh, this could be a gap that would be filled by city funds, as well as um, a lot of the, a lot of the um, small businesses, um, historically disadvantaged businesses, um, are also going to need to be uh, targeted for assistance. And so these are a couple of things I think that we need to be keeping in mind uh, should we choose to allocate funds, and um, which I hope that we will. Um, that's one thing I just wanted to, to, to put out there. Another is I, uh, last week I and the so-called big city mayors, there were cities, the, the eight largest cities in North Carolina, um, we're on the call with, uh, we had a call with the governor and, and the, the thing that I really tried to highlight with the governor and, and he knows this of course already is just the terrible situation we're in with our unemployment, uh, the state's unemployment system, the computer crashing that, it, that Andre mentioned. That, and the reason is that last week, you know, a month ago they were, they were processing 3000 applications a month. I'm sorry, 3,000 a week. Now they've got to process 300,000 that have come in the last two weeks. So it's not their fault that this system isn't working, but the need to like beef it up, get more people in there is all super important. And, you know, the governor knows that it's a huge priority for him. Uh, but I do think, I mean, I have gotten some of the saddest emails from people just trying to get into that unemployment system who are eligible. Um, and who just can't, you know, the computer's crashing, they're trying in the middle of the night. I mean, it's, it's a huge problem. Um, but I, I just wanted to mention that as well. Any other questions for Andre? Any comments? Andre, thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. And Andre. I appreciate your leadership and support. Thank you so much. Mr. Manager. Okay. So the last uh, thing we thought we would check in, Mayor, is a brief... Uh, conversation with our uh, budget director, Bertha Johnson. Uh, again, uh, we've spent the last couple of weeks uh, delving into a lot of uh, departmental budgets, but we know the hard work is about ready to get started. So I wanted Bertha just to give a quick update as to where we are and uh, what we're thinking about, maybe some next steps with the interaction with the council. Bertha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Bertha Johnson, Director of Budget and Management Services. Um, I want to briefly share with you that we have continued our budget process as scheduled. 
Um, we started budget presentations to the city manager, departmental presentations on March 30th. We have our final department scheduled for tomorrow, and we plan to have meetings with the joint uh, city county departments in conjunction with Durham County next week. Um, we are in the process of preparing the third quarter financial report, which is key to how we proceed with the remainder of the fiscal year. And um, we're working with our departments on their projections for revenue and expenditures for the remainder of the year. Um, as you may know, the third quarter report is really going to be the key to how we respond over the next quarter, as well as how we make adjustments in our next year's fiscal year's budget. We um, are, have been in conversation with the league, uh, with Dr. Walden and other large cities, as you have the mayor, um, trying to figure out you know, what the impact of COVID-19 will be on our revenues, particularly on sales tax, which is the second largest um, source of revenues in the general fund. Um, there are projections up to 10% of revenue loss from sales tax, which is significant from us because we get about $71 million in sales tax um, in the general fund each year. But not only sales tax, we're looking at the impact um, on the motel hotel tax, um, the gas tax, and as you've heard from some of our departments, program revenues, particularly in planning, inspections, uh, parking is significant, parks and recreation, transit will all be impacted, their program revenues will be impacted by this. Um, of course, again, we will continue to do a thorough review with our departments, uh, making those projections. Um, obviously, the revenue projections we share with you at the budget retreat will need to be uh, adjusted. And as such, we will be revising our budget development guidelines as well. Um, our, um, we have planned to have a um, conversation with you all in more detail, as Tom mentioned. Um, we are hopeful that we can do that. Um, in the near future, but one of the option is option is on April 23rd because you already have a city council meeting and we could do that um, in the morning prior to that meeting. We do want to have enough time to have some meaningful um, information for you all to move forward with um, the fourth quarter as well as uh, the next fiscal year in terms of adjusting our, our projections. The city manager is um, scheduled to present his budget on May 18th. We're still uh, planning for that to be the case. Uh, we're currently working through, as other cities are, what the preliminary budget process looks like and the document looks like, because we want to make sure that we have the best projections possible when we develop our documents. So um, as for uh, the final um, part of component of the budget is you know, public engagement. And so we're thinking about and uh, looking at formats that we can uh, engage in terms of making sure that we continue to have our residents engaged in the budget development process. We did all of our budget meetings with 18 meetings with our departments uh, with Zoom, with um, many folks on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the meeting as you have tonight, and that has worked well. And so we are looking at ways that we can uh, engage our, our residents in the budget development process Again, the, the, the most challenging uh, aspect of the budget process will be, for, will be revenues, um, general fund re revenues, as well as program revenues, and also looking at our existing tax rate, our bid rate, and other rates, and how we may want to approach them on the next fiscal year. And so it's going to be a challenge. Uh, we're working through it. Our department directors have been great. They all you know, completed their assignments in terms of their presentations and their projections. But, you know, of course, we didn't make a lot of changes at, you know, around the revenues at this point because we just don't have enough information. But we are working with others throughout the state to, on that issue and looking overall, I mean, there are projections that, you know, we will lose 20% of revenues around, uh, you know, discretionary spending for our residents and, and others. And so it's, it's going to be a challenge, but we're working through it and, you know, we will continue to work towards having a more detailed discussion with, with you all. I'm happy to take any questions. Bertha, thank you very much. And now I'm gonna ask if there are any questions for Bertha. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This um, is less of a question than a thought, but when we come together again um, and we talk about 
the fund balance. I know that you all had had an initial proposal for how to spend out the fund balance over the next um, few years, but given that we now, that that's kind of the rainy day fund and we're now experiencing quite a few rainy days, um, if y'all could give us some thoughts on ways to use that money um, differently in order to help support uh, some of the, help support people in the city um, who are struggling right now, support operations um, that we, you know, that we want to continue that may not have the resources that we need otherwise to continue. Um, so just some ideas from you all about other ways to um, allocate fund balance over the next couple of years. Thank you. That is on our list and we're working on that as well. We certainly know that we need to make changes in terms of how we had originally thought about using those resources. Thank you. Yeah, look at it from our last budget retreat. Um, we had such a healthy outlook for what the next year would look like. And now it's kind of in the blink of an eye, it's a completely different um, story. But thank you for all your work. And we know that y'all were in the right hands. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember, sorry, Councilmember Reese. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Bertha, I just, I don't have a question or even a suggestion. Uh, I just want to say that I can't imagine the job that is ahead of you and your staff right now. Um, this is exactly the wrong time to try to be figuring out uh, what next year's revenues are going to be, uh, given where we are in the uh, spread of the coronavirus in uh, this country and in this community, um, the incredible loss of jobs that we've experienced um, because of the choices that we've had to make. And I just want to say to you how much comfort it gives me to know that you and your staff are going to do the very best job possible for us and for the people of this city. This um, Every year, the budget is the most important thing we do as a city council. And none of us have ever faced a budget situation like the one we are going to have to face over between now and mid-June. And, uh, you know, I was talking to um, Councilmember Freeman over the weekend about how it just doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like a good idea to have to do the budget right now because we don't know so much mm -hmm. about what the real impact on the economy is going to be, what the lasting impact of the economy is going to be, how long will, it, will a recovery take. But, you know, for better or worse, we have to pass a budget. That's just one of the things we're required to do. And so I just wanted to say to you how grateful I am that we have someone with your experience and your dedication and the incredible quality of staff that you've accumulated in, uh, in recent years. And I feel, although it's going to be painful and it's going to require some really hard choices, I believe this council's up to that and I feel well armed for that conversation, knowing that you are going to be doing all the important work that we need you to do um, in the lead up to that. So thank you and um, good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Brawls. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Bertha, for your work and your steady hand um, throughout all this. I just one clarification. I know you don't have a lot of projections yet. You did mention 10% loss of revenue. That was just sales tax or was it sales and gas? Do you have any projections at this point about the loss in gas tax revenue? Sales tax um, is the revenue source I was referring to. With our gas tax revenues, it's those uh, revenues are based on population and street miles. And so it really depends on how much the state allocates uh, per capita as well as um, per street mile. So those we don't have projection on at this point. But we know the, the, the pie will be smaller, the pot will be smaller. Um, but it will not be significant. We've already received 100% of our revenues this year for that. So it'll be basically looking at next year um, revenue projections from the state. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, council members? Martha, thank you. We appreciate you. We know how hard this is gonna be. And, and I just do wanna say to my colleagues, this is something we're gonna have to step up to. We are in a, you know, everybody's been saying a very different situation and a lot of our hopes and dreams for some awesome stuff we really want to do, we're not going to be able to do. And we're going to need guidance from our staff and then we're going to have to step up to it. And I know that we will. Thank you, Bertha. Thank you. I look forward to talking to you all more in the future. Thank you.
Mr. Mayor, that uh, concludes our presentations. If we you have any other questions on anything we didn't cover, we try to answer those. That's all we have right now. Thank you very much. I think we've done it. Uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, we're, uh, that was a good long couple of hours, more than a couple of hours. And I feel like you all did a great job in educating us. Uh, colleagues, if there's nothing else on that, I'm going to go ahead and move to our second item, uh, which is a discussion of the timeline to conduct the Council Ward 3 replacement process. And I'm going to uh, ask Councilmember Reese, the head of our Council Procedures Committee, if he would like to start us off with a presentation uh, about his uh, recommendations, and uh, and then we'll we'll have a discussion about that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank all my colleagues. I had the opportunity uh, late last week and over the weekend to speak with each of you individually about the the vacancy that we um, uh, now know is coming because we have accepted um, our colleague Renetta Alston's uh, resignation. Or, or I guess I should say, I think, um, and the city clerk can correct me, but I do think we are supposed to vote on that. Um, and so we'll try to remember to do that during this meeting. I think that's something we have to do. Um, in any event, um, I wanted to share with- uh, Charlie, excuse me one second. Let me stop you right there and ask the attorney, um, uh, it, what is what is our obligation here? Do we vote on that vacancy that tonight since we had the reg, I mean, not on the vacancy, do we vote on the accepting the resignation tonight? You do, yes, Mr. Mayor, you should vote on that pursuant to the charter provision. Thank you. And if we don't all agree, then she can't leave, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that? Yeah, no, she- That's, she a, that's a good trick. <laughs> okay, do I have a motion that she can't leave? No. Uh, all right, thank you, Madam Attorney. Uh, Charlie, sorry to interrupt you, go ahead. No, that's okay, as long as everybody remembers, we gotta do that before we get off the call. Um, <clears throat> so um, at the direction of Mayor Shul, uh, and in consultation with each of you and after reviewing thoroughly uh, the provisions in the city charter and the council procedures manual about a vacancy of a city council member, I prepared a proposed timeline for conducting the process to fill this, this upcoming vacancy in the city council and shared that with each of you and senior staff at the city uh, last week, uh, towards the end of last week. And um, let me walk through the dates there and then talk about some of the issues. And then obviously we'll have a, a good discussion about that as the mayor suggested. Uh, today, the first step in that timeline is tonight. Um, and it is the thing we'll probably do at the very end of the meeting because I think we'll all wanna put it off as long as possible. And that is the vote to accept the resignation of Councilmember Alston effective, um, as I understand it, Thursday, April 9th, um, 2020, at just before midnight. Uh, can I get a thumbs up on that, Councilmember Alston? Does that sound yeah, correct? That's correct. Great. Um, and um, the next day, Friday, April 10th, uh, the city clerk would post uh, what's called a notice of vacancy, a draft of which we have seen uh, that she has shared with us last week. Um, the city clerk would make the application uh, for um, candidates to want to apply for the vacancy as well as the questionnaire uh, that we developed as a group uh, two years ago, the last time we had to do this. Um, and uh, those would be made available um, starting that Friday, April 10th, 2020. Um, and Co uh, concurrent with that, the city of Durham would obviously send out a press release um, indicating that the vacancy has now occurred and that the process for choosing a successor to Councilmember Alston uh, has begun. Um, the, I'm just now getting a, a message from our city clerk uh, <laughs> um, that uh, Friday, April 10th is Good Friday, um, which I should have known, uh, but did not. Um, and so uh, we'll obviously have to make some adjustments to this timeline as we uh, go forward in this process. But I'll, I'll give you what I originally came up with and then we'll figure out how we need to change it. Um, the council procedures manual requires uh, 10 days uh, that the application process be remain open. Uh, although as a council, we can um, change that timeline if we decide that's the appropriate thing to do. 
Um, maybe we want to do that now that we know that Friday, April 10th is a holiday. I don't know. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but assuming we had a full 10 days and assuming we could start on February, on Friday, April 10th, the application and questionnaires would then be due on Monday, April 20th. Um, my proposed timeline has us during the council work session on Thursday, April 23rd, um, voting to identify three to seven finalists. Again, that is consistent with the process laid out in our procedures manual. Um, and then um, after identifying the finalists on Monday, April 27th, um, at a special evening council meeting called for this purpose, uh, the council would conduct interviews of the three to seven finalists. Um, and then the on Thursday, April 13th, um, four days later, um, the council would then vote on the appointment um, and our new colleague would be sworn in either that day or um, at our Monday, May 4th uh, council meeting. And obviously the details of the swearing in have to be figured out uh, to do it at appropriate social distancing and all that good stuff. Um, and I think um, that's the timeline I put together and there are certainly ways that we can tweak it to cut to account for the fact that Friday, April 10th is a holiday. But before we talk about the specifics, let me talk more broadly about the process uh, and why I think it's important for us to proceed. We, um, the city charter requires us to at least attempt to fill a vacancy created in a member of the Durham City Council. Uh, the city charter is really clear. Uh, the word used is shall, not may, uh, if uh, it says shall. There's one exception and that is if we uh, can't uh, do it if because we have an even number of members we can't um, and if we fail to do that uh, then within 60 days a special election is there thereby called um, and uh, the the idea that we would allow a special election to go forward um, without trying to fill the vacancy um, seems uh, difficult to understand especially given that um, that would mean that the residents of Ward 3 in the city of Durham are without representation on the council for approximately eight months um, when our new colleague could be sworn in uh, in December. And so uh, for that reason, um, because I think there are some uh, challenges in terms of how representative the council will be without a Ward 3 representative because of the fact that I think the charter requires us to go through this process that I'm advocating uh, that we go forward. The other thing is we've got 60 days. We could take 60 days to do it. My concern there is that if the clock starts running um, on Friday morning, April 10th, that puts us at about June 8th or 9th as the deadline for appointing that person. And obviously we hope to be voting on a budget very shortly thereafter. And I think that's incredibly unfair to our, whoever our future colleague may be, that we would ask her or him to uh, weigh in on that budget uh, so quickly after being sworn in. Um, I think if we follow some version of the timeline that I've proposed, uh, that that will bring our new colleague online uh, on board um, on or about May 4th, and that uh, that person would let then be, allow, be able to go through the process with us, um, alongside us, and, um, and then be able to cast a meaningful vote uh, for or against the budget when the time comes. I know that I personally would have to vote no if I was sworn in seven days before we voted on the budget, because I couldn't possibly figure out what's in that and know whether or not I wanted to support it. Um, so those are the uh, those are some of the issues more broadly. I will note um, that just prior to this meeting, we received a resolution uh, from Chairman Omar Beasley of the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People, who um, and the the committee is asking us not to appoint uh, a successor. Uh, and to allow um, a, a special election to go forward. Um, and obviously, uh, I think that's um, not the not something that we can do. I think we have to at least try. Um, and if we fail to do that, then a, then a special election will be called by operation of law. Um, I guess the last thing I wanted to say is that um, this is much like the budget. It's not really fair that we have to go through this right now. Um, you know, in, in a perfect world, uh, we would be able to take uh, the amount of time, the same amount of time that we did uh, two years ago to appoint a successor to um, uh, Mayor Shule, uh, as a, in his at-large seat, we would be able to have in-person um, 
public comment periods where people could come to a microphone and tell us to our face what they thought about the various candidates, about us, about whatever they wanted to talk about, about this process. Um, but uh, because of the coronavirus and the various mandates that we're operating under, that's not gonna be possible, uh, at least as far as I can tell. Um, that means that it's gonna be hard, uh, but it also, but I think in that case, we just have to do what's hard. Um, and uh, I think we will bear a, a particularly heavy burden uh, to collaborate together and with other community leaders and organizations to try to come up with uh, robust forms of public input and comment that don't include um, going to showing up at a city council meeting in person and delivering remarks at the microphone. But I think we're up to that challenge. I think Durham's up to that challenge. Um, and I think it's, um, it's really important that we move forward. So that's my proposal. Um, obviously, we're gonna have to tweak some of the dates if we decide to move forward because of the holiday. Um, but I've probably talked way too much and I'm interested to hear other people's thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Randall. I absolutely did not talk way too much. I thought that was a great presentation. I thought you covered a lot of the really important uh, ground, Charlie, uh, Council Member Reese. So thank you so much for doing the work. And I really appreciate you uh, reaching out to all of us individually. It was very helpful to have a heads up uh, before the meeting. So thank you. All right, I'm gonna now open this up for discussion and uh, hear what folks have to say about uh, the proposal that Council Member Reese has made. Uh, any thoughts that anyone has, uh, questions, comments, go for it. I don't see any hands. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, quick question. When the thing about 10 days, the application period being 10 days, that we can adjust that, can we adjust that in either direction? Absolutely. Um, the That portion is not in the charter. It's in our procedures manual. Um, it was a requirement we created last time around. And um, that particular paragraph includes language that it could be a different period of time that the city council wants. And then at the very bottom of that section that deals with vacancies, there's a kind of a catch-all provision that says that the council can change this process, this procedure um, in, in the interest of expediency or some other language. So we can move it either direction if we want, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you can you guys hear? Can, can you hear? Yeah, me? yeah, we can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And let me uh, thank um, my colleague, uh, Councilor Reese, who always does a, a yeoman's job and stuff like this. His attention to detail and uh, just uh, thoroughness uh, always comes to whatever task he's given. So I want to really. Um, Thank him for the work he's done and thank him for the conversations we've had uh, as counselors individually about this most sacred and important decision uh, that faces us right now as a council. And that is filling uh, one of our seats uh, that is ultimately owned by the people of this city. Uh, and I want to assert the ownership of these seats, um, from the city, uh, ownership of these uh, seats uh, by the people of the city. Uh, Councilor Reese. Uh, alluded to a statement that we received from the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People. I thank him for uh, mentioning that uh, on record. And I do uh, want to, to challenge my colleagues. I, I want to just have a heartfelt conversation about um, the process and, and what we face filling the seat under the circumstances that we are. Um, I want to appeal uh, to the council to uh, indeed fill the seat by special election. And I will, I will address um, some of uh, Charlie's comments, Councilor Reese's comments about this being compulsory on us. Um, this this plan and the timetable is an adoption, uh, adaptation of a plan uh, that was conceived and adopted and implemented under regular order and during normal times. And I don't think there's anyone in this city uh, that thinks that we are operating under regular order or normal times, perhaps the most dramatic illustration of that is the way we're having this meeting tonight. We can't even have it in our own chamber. All of the shells that guide our country have been suspended. The federal government has pushed back the date to file taxes. Uh, we're not cutting off uh, uh, utility services. Uh, you can go down a list of shells in our country that because of this pandemic, we are not facing. And if we are, if this is the one carve out, if this is the area 
out of all the areas in the country that are being upended uh, that we must engage in, <clears throat> then I'd like to challenge us in, in considering some things. Um, I believe uh, if we implement this plan under emergency orders, that we are potentially uh, inviting a master class on what it looks like to have privilege insulate you from hardship, a master class in it. And by that, I mean the people who we spend a lot of time talking about who we, most, who were, who we are most concerned about accessing government, uh, inclusion, equity, would bear the most hardship in accessing this process at this time. I wanna talk about our scorecard uh, for equity when we're not under a pandemic. Think about it. Um, <clears throat> participatory budgeting, we had an excellent uh, rollout of participatory budgeting, $2.4 million, um, tens of thousands of people voting. 60% of those voters were white. When there wasn't a pandemic, that was our scorecard when we weren't under emergency orders. And I know we're talking about we're gonna really lean in and do a great job to make sure folks can access it. Uh, people can't pay their water bill. Um, we um, are talking about uh, instituting stipends for our boards and commissions because we recognize we don't have representation from lower socioeconomic strata. And that's without a pandemic. That, that's under regular order. That, that's our scorecard for equity and, and accessing government. That's how we're doing under regular order. Um, we came up with a plan for uh, immigrant brothers and sisters who didn't want to give their address to participate in boards and commissions that required them physically coming in to the building. And Councilman Middleton, I can't, I can't hear you anymore. Yeah, I lost Mark Anthony. Council member, can you say something to us? Let's see. Now we've really lost him. Can the rest of you all hear me? Can you all hear me? I guess. All right. Councilmember Middleton, say something. Is your, use, your, uh, use your chat box. Can you check your computer microphone? Do that. Do that again. All right. Let's see. Anybody else? Any any tech person out there? Um, from the city who might have some ideas. I'm not sure if Daniel's on the I call. Send, I just sent him a text to let him know we dropped him and suggest he try to sign back in. Okay. I didn't hear back from him yet. I could drive over and take in my iPad. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's think for a second. Um, Diana says his mute button is on, but oh yeah, it is on. Now it's off. The mute button isn't a problem. Yeah, it's something else. Mark Anthony, try signing out and signing back in. Yeah. OK, 
okay, well, I, 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 well I'm going to use, I'm going to use this time to. Um, uh, one of the deputy city managers says in the chat that it has something, it's, it has something to do with his signal strength wherever he is. Okay, well, maybe when he signs back in, we'll see what happens. But I'm going to use this time to think about dinner that I haven't had yet. And very much looking forward to eating after the meeting. Me too, Mr. Mayor. Me too. I didn't know y'all were going to be so daggone long-winded. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> you, you know us. You know how You're it is. Always, always talking all the time. Exactly. Especially Council Member Alston. She's a big She's a chatterbox. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've texted him. I see from Wanda, can someone text him and tell him to sign back and sign back in? I think we've done it, have we not? Yes, I did. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Steve, can we call like an official five minute break? Yes, I think we can. Okay. Um, let's call an official five minute break, uh, a, a recess, I believe we called Madam Attorney. Is that correct? Can you hear Madam me? Attorney, can we take a five minute recess? You may, yes, Mr. Mayor, you can recess the meeting for five minutes for people to. All right. Thank you. Break. We'll yes. take a five minute break and hopefully Mark Anthony will be back on by then. Uh, and we'll, we'll reconvene in five minutes. Do we sign out and call back in or do we just stop our no. video? No, don't, don't, don't sign out. We may never get you back. We'll get back. <laughs> There's Mark Anthony. Oh, we tried. There. He's back. Mark Anthony, are you back? I thought I heard you for a second. Yeah, I can't. I still can't hear him, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I think his signal strength is just challenged. Okay. That isn't going to fix itself. All right. So, um, well, we said we're going to um, recess for five minutes. So. Back to five minutes to talk about situation. We may have to reconvene to discuss this.
to one thing I want to be sure to do tonight is to vote to accept Council Member Austin's resignation, period. We can reconvene for the other stuff, period. Okay. Okay. All right, here we are. Yeah. Okay. Hey folks, I'm on the phone. I don't know if I'm showing up on the screen. Mark Anthony, you're not showing up on the screen, okay. but we are hearing you on the phone. Mr. Mayor, he's Great. down at the very bottom. Yeah, that's probably the best we're gonna get if we're on the phone. Yeah, he's got a, you can see a cell phone number down there. Yeah. On the good old gray phone, I think that's him. Yeah, that's him. Doesn't look oh. like himself. Doesn't really look like himself. <laughs> looks more like a gray phone, but okay. Um, Mark Anthony, we're taking a five minute recess and as soon as um, it looks like, uh, I think council member Freeman and mayor pro Tem, we'll just give them another minute. Okay. Mayor pro Tem's can here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, thanks. Council member Freeman's thank back to Apologies. I don't know what's going on. Um, what uh, what uh, Wanda says is, and the tech people think that you just, it's something about low signal strength and so, um, uh, okay. Yeah, um, but um, I, please go ahead. You were speaking, and I think we're we're now ending the recess. Everyone's back. Um, so uh, please go ahead. Thank you. I I think I don't know where I dropped off, but my 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 the thrust of my first point was that um, all of the shells that that our nation's been living under have been suspended. And and I'm I'm just I find it curious that the only thing we're compelled to do of all of the carve outs, I mean we I haven't voted on anything that's happened in the city as an elected official in you know in weeks. And I, I certainly support the mayor's exercise of emergency uh, powers, but but it's pretty much been ruled by fiat. So nothing the world is upside down uh, right now. So so that's one of the things that informs my um, concerns about filling this seat. My belief is that those folks that we're most concerned about uh, in our equity work are the ones that will have the highest bar to clear, to participate in this process. Um, and when I said a master class on um, privilege, insulating you from uh, harm, um, by definition, those that will participate in this process will be one people who are not worried about paying bills, who are not worried about unemployment, uh, who aren't worried about a, a sick a family member. And I think that with all of our concern about equity and access, that the folk who we are most concerned about are the ones who will have the least amount of access uh, in this process. Um, I also think that that as much, and I believe we are well-intentioned to, to go out of our way and really meet this challenge to let folk in, but I think our optimism is, is really the optimism of privilege. Th those of us that sit on this council, um, 
for the most part, I, you know, aren't facing some of the things that other people are facing uh, in our city. And I think as much as we are well-intentioned on making this process uh, accessible, it's hard enough when we're not under a pandemic. I also want to say that that I, I, I find the Ward 3 representation argument um, a, bit, uh, a bit curious, particularly uh, from those of us who know how this system works. Um, those of us in partic particularly who sit on this council have intimate knowledge that we don't have a true ward system. Uh, we have a, a, a zip code diversity system in place. We use the nomenclature ward system, uh, but we don't have a true uh, ward system. We don't, uh, each of us doesn't control a pot of money that we have control over like an alderman system in our particular ward. Our UDO, our comprehensive plan doesn't carve out uh, uh, pieces uh, that are ward specific or zoning issues that are ward, ward specific. And I, I wonder what the corollary of that argument would be. Would we say that if the seat we were filling were an at large seat, would we argue that we need to fill it because the whole city is lacking representation because one of our at large seats uh, isn't filled? Um, I don't think we would argue that. And if we did, then are we suggesting that perhaps we should uh, give some more special powers to ward seats? Uh, perhaps give deference to ward representatives when there's a specific issue that we're voting on that is located in our ward. And of course, none of that exists because we do not have a ward system. Uh, the system we have actually allows not only for a ward representative, but there's nothing that precludes all three at-large seats coming for any particular ward. So under regular circumstances, a ward uh, seat could be augmented by all of the at-large seats also coming from that ward. Um, so I, I, I just find that um, that argument a bit curious since we do not have a true uh, ward system. We are all empowered to, to look out for the good of the city. Uh, our votes, it's one person, one vote. We don't weight our votes, uh, particularly for, for any particular member of the council when, it's, you know, when, the, when the vote is germane to our particular ward or neighborhood. Um, I think so we, so I, I just find that a, a curious argument. I don't, I don't find it very uh, compelling. We have a fully functional legal quorum um, on our council uh, uh, with the six of us. Uh, we don't have to uh, maintain a partisan majority uh, like they do in the legislature. So the dynamics for us uh, are very different uh, than other bodies. Uh, so we can function. I think the question before us is, is, should we do this under these circumstances? And finally, with respect to the ordinance, and I certainly respect of the letter of the law, but but the, or, the at least from my point of view, the ordinance contemplates an election um, for a reason. I, I mean, the fact that the ordinance allows for a special election, and and I don't think it offers any editorial that an election is is inferior or less preferred. Um, and I and I, I think we have to be careful about sending that signal to the to the people of the city. Uh, I think it count it, it it contemplates an election. Uh, because it realizes there are exigencies under which we cannot fill the seat. And, that it's, and, and Charlie talked about some attempts, and I agree with him. If we make an attempt, political gridlock uh, may not fill the seat. We may not feel we have qualified applicants uh, that apply. Or there could be an invisible pathogen sent from the pits of hell that are trying to kill us all. And, 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 and I think that's an exigency uh, that is before us right now. Um, that 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 at least asks us, I think compels us actually to consider an election. I think the best way to assure that Ward 3 is represented is to allow the people of Ward 3 to vote uh, on the seat uh, that the people of this city uh, own. Um, and I think we have to be careful also, and I know it, it's not deliberate, that we somehow suggest that an election is, is, is inferior or less preferable to the selection process. Um, elections are sacred. Elections are good things. That's how we're elected officials. That's how we all got our seats. Uh, and I think um, whatever price we pay, if, 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 we, if we make the election in November or pay for an earlier election, I think that's the price we pay to maintain the, the ownership of the seats um, of the people uh, of the seats. Uh, so I, I think uh, until we can play basketball again, until we can go see Hamilton, until we can eat in a restaurant, until we can physically come into City Hall and pay our bills, then I don't think we should create a higher bar uh, than already exists to sit on this council uh, for folks who may not have computer access, who are worried about, who would have filled out an application, but are worried about employment right now, 
or uh, worried about bills, worried about whether their their real job, uh, the job that actually pays the bills, is going to be there. Um, but I think to 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 date ourselves into thinking that we can meet the challenge of making sure this process is, is open and fully transparent when we struggle with that under normal circumstances. Again, I think, and I'm including me in this, this is the optimism of our privilege, I think. Uh, if we want to uh, uh, involve Ward 3 and make sure they're represented, we should let them vote. So I respectfully and, and humbly uh, ask my colleagues to consider uh, filling this seat um, during an election because the world is turned upside down. Nothing is normal. Uh, we are under emergency powers right now. We're having this meeting right now uh, because nothing is the same. And I don't think it's realistic that folks who struggle under normal circumstances will really have full access to this process uh, as it exists. So thank you for that. I, whatever the council decides, of course, I will go with it. And I, I know we'll have a robust discussion in filling the seat. But this is critically important. Uh, and these are challenging times. And, and I think uh, that we should uh, let this seat be filled by election. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Middleton, and um, appreciate you hanging in there with the technology. Thank um, you. Sorry for that. No, it's not your fault. But thank you for hanging in. Um, other comments? Other comments? Other, anyone else? Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Councilmember Caballero was raising her hand, but it was disappearing into the background. No, okay. <laughs> I had my mic on and I moved to turn it off. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. Okay, great. Then I'll go next. Thanks. Um, I want to appreciate um, Councilmember Reese for putting the schedule together um, and for his um, work to put together a process that I think meets um, a number of our goals. I'm also, um, you know, I, I hear Council Member Middleton's um, concerns and objections, and um, it is true, we are in a very um, unprecedented time and an unprecedented moment in our city. Um, I don't, however, believe that that removes us from the responsibility of doing all of the things that we can do um, to hold to the um, procedures that we govern ourselves by and the charter that governs our community. And we can um, appoint someone. We're not prevented from doing that by this pandemic. We are simply challenged to, um, to build a process, uh, an inclusive process by which people can give us feedback um, in a in a virtual, a more virtual world, a more virtual space. I believe that we can do that. Uh, the majority of the input that we got during the appointment process that added Council Member Caballero to our council was um, via email. We got very few um, people coming to City Hall to discuss the appointment process, but we received a lot of email um, and letters and I think a couple of phone calls about the appointment process. So that's a way in which our residents are already um, used to engaging with city government and have engaged with an appointment process in the past. Um, this appointment would be for an even a, a slightly shorter period of time um, than Council Member Caballero's uh, first um, first chunk of a term, right? It's just a little over a year and a half. Um, and to to put city resources into a special election for one out of seven seats for less than half a term, um, especially in a time where we know that our resources are, are going to be limited, does not feel to me like, um, like a good choice. I think that we can and will be able to create a process where people can have their voices heard and can be included, and that that's what we should do. We should move forward with an appointment. Um, I have a couple uh, logistical suggestions regarding um, Council Member Reese's uh, proposed schedule. Um, given that uh, the 10th is Good Friday, if we were to um, just move the notice of vacancy posting until the following Monday, April 13th, um, we could make the applications and questionnaires due by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, April 21st, so give people a little bit of extra time. It's a little bit less um, than the 10 days, I think it's eight 
days. Um, but I think that that is enough time for people to do a short application and a questionnaire and we'll um, be able to review those. We'll have about a day and a half to review them before our council meeting on the 23rd where we would ID finalists. So that's my proposed scheduled week. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, anyone, uh, Council Member Caballero? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you to uh, my colleague, Council Member Rees, for putting this uh, forward and also for uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Member Middleton's comments. Uh, while we are definitely facing, you know, unprecedented times, our roles are still um, very active. And if we were to suspend everything um, until this pandemic was over, we would not be having this meeting this evening. We would not be losing our council member colleague Alston because the reason we're losing her so quickly is because she's getting sworn into the General Assembly, which begins its short session on April 28th. So they are actually moving forward. Uh, we are in the hard predicament of having to move functions of our city forward, including our roles as council members. We will be taking up votes potentially virtually later this month because our past work session that was canceled that we were meeting that we were, we're going to vote on and then this upcoming one. We will be passing those work sessions, which means we will be passing all of those contracts virtually later in May. And we are still, excuse me, later in April. And we are also still beholden to pass a budget by June 30th. So to think that we are not undertaking the work of governing while this pandemic is happening is not true. Um, I am particularly concerned about the cost of an election when we just heard from our budget director about the potential um, really challenging fiscal issue that we're going to be facing with this budget and to have an election in November for a seat that will then re-up in 2021 just does not seem um, like the best use of our resources and while this is challenging and I think that ideally we would have a different choice. We are not faced with that choice. We, we lose our colleague. I'm actually also concerned that we will have to pass a budget and what happens if we are gridlocked 3-3 with a budget in June. And that's why this is a seven member board. And that's why I believe we need to move as quickly as possible uh, to make sure that we are a seven member board. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other comments? Any more comments? Ms. Rack, I can't see if anybody's raising their hand, but I'll, I'll certainly yield if other colleagues wanted to comment. Yeah, Council Member Freeman is, I'll get back to you though, Council Member Middleton. Council Member Freeman thank is you. raising her hand and uh, Council Member Freeman, go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. And um, I also wanna echo uh, the thanks for Council Member Reese uh, delving into this task and coming up with a timeline and few days. Um, I do want to take a moment and just note that I, I'm, what I'm hearing from Council Member Middleton is specific to actual representation, not in the form of um, engagement. And so I'm, I'm, I would like to hear more um, around how you make sure that uh, folks we talk about being, you know, inclusive with are involved in this process as actual applicants, not just as a voice to say whether they like or don't like. It's not about, I don't, I'm not, I'm more concerned about how heavy this, this uh, board is on people who aren't working full-time jobs and don't have the, the mixed um, priorities or responsibilities around holding the job and, and being council members and how the timeline is shortened. And so it, it looks like I got to take time off from work. And it looks like a lot of very heavy um, privileged conversation around what this looks like and pushing it through in a month. And so I'm really concerned about moving fast. I, I know very well that I like to go slow to speed up. And so I like to make sure that we dot, dot our I's and cross our T's as much as possible. I'm very cautious about um, about the decisions we make as far as 
as far as a council member being added and as far as the budget. And so just noting that uh, the comment was a little off-putting of um, council member Caballero about a 3-3 split. I mean, I think as the mayor has said in the past, we've been 95% of the, like the budget has been an agreement. So I don't know that there would be an issue on whether or not there'd be six of us to make the decision. I think we can all see that these are extraordinary times and we can come to agreement on what the priorities need to be covered, which would be the residents of this community. Um, and so I'm not as concerned about that. I, I, um, I know that the work that has to happen has to happen with staff involvement. And I am very concerned about pulling on staff to do any of this of this uh, process. And I know how much it took the last time around and just how hard it was to have people engaged in both the application process and in the engagement. And I, and I really do appreciate Council Member Middleton pointing out uh, just how flat uh, we can be without the pandemic. And so just noting that the, the complexities of adding a pandemic and all of the health related issues that come along with it, I'm just, I'm just really concerned that we're making this a priority over the fact that, I mean, there isn't even any place for folks who are, who are un, unsheltered and living on the street to shower and wash their hands. And that should be what we're focused on, you know, pushing forward and figuring out how to solve. Like there's a lot, um, there's just a lot. I know I spend my time uh, coming up with solutions around um, trying to find ways to support families with young children in this community. And I'm, I stress this to Council Member Reese in that I felt like it was a value judgment to say that, that we were not holding, or we were not holding up our end of the, of the, um, of the responsibility and, and actually performing, performing some effort around um, creating an appointment process and going through an appointment process. When you know that there is a, a, a crisis at hand, I think it would be more responsible to actually uh, push this out a little bit and making sure that we're uh, past this, this uh, peak because I'm, I'm also very concerned about the fact that we haven't taken up anything to, to, to address short-term rentals and all the folks who are coming to the city um, from other areas. There, there's, a, there's just a number of, of areas that I haven't heard tonight that weren't even touched or weren't even covered. And I don't, I don't know that there are answers to those questions. There probably are, and I haven't heard them. I haven't had a chance to sit down with the city manager nor the city attorney. I mean, there, there's, there's just so much moving right now. And I think the fact that there are folks who are on council who aren't working have time to focus on that is great. But I want to make sure that when you're going, moving forward in a process and you actually have um, people who are engaged who would not normally be involved in this, they're likely to be working. And I want to make sure that we're as open to the to the people as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you, colleagues, so much. I really appreciate the uh, the spirit uh, uh, and the and the substance of this debate. Uh, I, I just want to be very clear, um, and I, I did not at any point, and I'm sure the record will reflect it, say that um, we're not doing anything as a government. Uh, what I said was we are a government that is operating under emergency footing. Um, DPAC is closed, our parks are closed, our businesses are closed. And I didn't vote on any one of those things. None of us voted on that. Those things were issued by fiat by our mayor using emergency power, which I support. So the fact of the matter is the government is functioning, but it is functioning under emergency powers. And this is what it looks like. Um, the mayor is pretty much, this is the closest we'll get to, and I know my, my political uh, uh, sophisticated friends are going to hate me using this term. This is the closest we'll get to looking at what a, a strong mayor looks like under emergency powers where executive uh, directives are, are essentially being issued. And we haven't voted on anything, colleagues. So uh, the government's functioning, but it's, we're functioning under emergency powers. So I just wanna be clear uh, about that. Um, secondly, I remember a pretty full room during the uh, uh, selection process that, that gave us, uh, fortunately gave us, uh, Councilor Caballero, uh, a full chamber the night when folk were speaking to us. And I remember robust 
uh, audiences during the time when we interviewed people uh, in person. So yes, it was very internet intensive, but there was definitely some FaceTime with folk as well. And to be clear, I'm not talking about the people who will have input about the process. I'm talking about people who may actually want to sit in the seat, who may actually want to apply to be on the city council, who by definition will now have to do it by computer because our building is closed. And what if they don't have internet access? I'm talking about the people who actually want to serve on the city council, who won't be thinking about filling out an application because they're going to be thinking about their paycheck. They're going to be thinking about whether they have a job or not. Those are the people I'm talking about, those who will actually sit in the seat or who could potentially sit in the seat, not just those who will give us input or guidance about those who will sit in the seat. And finally, we absolutely can do this. That's not my issue. My question is, should we do it? Do we have to do it? Can we do this in a way that if we have a choice of doing this in a way where we have more inclusion or less, why would we not choose more? If we can do this in a way where we have more access than not, why would we consciously choose less? We have, we le we have a fully functioning quorum with six folks. Uh, we did it. Uh, uh, before Council Caballero joined us, and, and you know, we, we worked out just fine. Um, I find the prospect of a potential 3-3 vote, when this council historically has almost voted unanimously on a whole bunch of stuff, I find the prospect of a, a potential 3-3 vote far less compelling than the prospect of having a process where we can have more people involved than less. That's what compel what's compelling to me. I absolutely agree we can do this process. The question before is before us is should we, and I think we should not. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And oh, oh finally, I'm sorry. The, we have an election coming up in November. It, uh, November, there's an election schedule. We're going to be voting for president and a whole bunch of other stuff. So we can piggyback on that election that we're going to have anyway in November. And if we choose to have a special election, I think we should consider that the price of ownership of these seats. That's the price we pay to ensure that the ownership rights over these seats of the people of Durham are assured. This council certainly has not been afraid to spend money on a whole lot of things. I think there are far less things, far less important things we can spend money on than an election that ensures the ownership rights are asserted over these seats. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council member. Council member Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I feel conflicted about weighing in on this process at all, but I'll kind of give a very, very brief uh, two cents just on the equity argument. Um, and I, re I recognize kind of as Councilmember Milton has laid out that the, the, the paradigm that we're working under is different uh, than it ever has been uh, for us and for so many people. Um, I do just want to say kind of under perhaps different circumstances, I think the argument could be made that um, an appointment actually, and I, this is difficult with COVID, but uh, an appointment actually is a more accessible way to enter elected office insofar as if someone has to go through a special election, even for a municipal election, um, there are expenses involved. There's, you know, typically, you know, campaign fundraising that has to take place. There, there, there are oftentimes more barriers to folks having access to a political campaign than, than to an application. Um, and so, you know, I don't state that as a preference. Again, I, I, I want to kind of err on the side of leaving that to the 60 all to decide what the process is, but I feel concerned about leaving the seat open um, any longer than it has to be. I do think that our procedures lay out uh, a strong process that I think gives you all room and latitude to make changes to make it more accessible under the circumstances. And I'm concerned that a special election would in, in reality uh, be harder for folks who are um, uh, lower income or who have, are having difficulty accessing finances or fundraising networks or who are unemployed um, to actually participate meaningfully in that process. So I just put that out there. Thank you very much. Any, com any other comments? Okay. Um, Council Member Prim. Uh, I, I appreciate that, um, Council Member Austin, and um, I think that's why I'm, I'm specifically concerned about the, that 30-day turnaround and uh, recognizing that that's really a, a, a heavy burden to put on anyone. 
Thank you. Uh, okay. Other comments? Anyone else have Mr. comments? Mayor, like, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I'd like to associate myself with Councillor Alston, my distinguished counsel, who we're going to miss tremendously. I'm going to associate myself uh, with her comments and say, yes, uh, uh, elections are prohibitive. And, and it does, you know, you do need to raise money and do all those things. Um, and that, that it's hard when there's not a pandemic. And, and I think that's my point. In any process, whether it's the selection process or an election, carries with the challenges. Now take that process under normal circumstances and add a pandemic to it and add uh, uh, you know, this emergency situation to it. I'm not suggesting that elections are perfect. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you know, they, they're, they're a panacea to, to equity by all means. Uh, but at least you have a, you know, you have you have uh, uh, the opportunity to go ask people for money. Um, this process, they've got to ask six people for their vote, who they can talk to only through a computer, if you have a computer. They can't talk to us in person. They can't be around us. Uh, City Hall is closed, and 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 my point is is that everything that that even represents or 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 to some degree represents normalcy is topsy turvy. Donald Trump's federal government has moved the due date for, for tax filing. That's how upside down the world is right now. So, so I, I, you know, I, I hear you, and I agree with you that elections by, in and of themselves have barriers. I just think it's much harder for any election or selection process to be undertaken while we're, we're facing an invisible enemy that's trying to kill us all. Um, so for that reason, I think we, we have the wherewithal. This is just a principal decision. I, I, I think we can choose to, to uh, uh, take the path that would allow more people access, people who want to weigh in on the process and people who actually want to participate in the process. And again, uh, whatever the, the cost of an election, whatever the cost of a special election is, I'm certain it won't exceed $2.4 million. And I think, it's far, I think an election is far more important to these seats. These seats are the property of the people of Durham. What price do you put on it? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Um, any other comments? So um, we have in front of us a schedule that Council Member Reese has proposed. Um, and uh, I would like to try to decide tonight how we're gonna proceed. It looks like you're Schedule has the April 10th problem, uh, no matter what we decided. Um, so, um, and I, I'll just say that I don't think that keeping the, uh, I think the 10 days is, personally, I think is the minimum for, uh, the applications to come in. I don't think cutting that down by a couple of days is a good idea. I see our attorney has some thoughts. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I just wanted to point out that your council procedures provide that um, applications shall be submitted within no more than 10 days. Um, so, so it's a council procedural rule. It's y'all's yeah. rule. Um, and I also want to correct an earlier comment that I made. So the requirement that you all vote to accept Council Member Alston's resignation is actually also in the council procedures. It's uh, Rule 2.8. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Anybody want to make any comments on this schedule? Then we can decide if, whether or not we want to adopt this schedule or not. Council Member Reese? Um, one thing we could do um, is have applications and questionnaires due Thursday, April 13th, which is 10 days after Monday, April 13th, um, which will the clerk confirm for me that is not a holiday, the Monday after Easter? I don't think it is, but um, while, while that's coming through. Um, and just move everything forward one step uh, in the calendar. So, um, hi, Madam Clerk. Hello. Hi. The 13th is not a holiday. Fantastic. Not Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just move everything forward in one step. So the so the applications would be due on the 23rd, application to the questionnaires due the 23rd, 
at the Monday, we would have a special meeting on April 27th, Monday, for the purpose of identifying three to seven finalists. Um, on Thursday, April 30th, we would have a special meeting uh, for interviews. And then on Monday, May 4th, and, and, and by the way, at the end of that meeting on April 30th, we could vote um, on our selection, have them sworn in on May 4th, or we could um, roll the decision forward to that Monday, May 4th meeting and have the person sworn in after we vote um, and take uh, their seat on the dais and participate with us in the meeting. Um, or we could do, uh, yeah, I think that's probably, those are our options. Mayor Pro Tem? You are still muted, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, working out. Okay, great. Thanks. Could you just say all that one more time? <laughs> uh, basically, the if if you can pull up the email that I sent um, last week, or um, you can just pull up the chat function where I've pasted this calendar in here. Yep. Um, the currently we have the um, the um, notice of vacancy being posted on Friday, April 10th, because that's a holiday. I would propose rolling that forward to having the notice of vacancy uh, published on Monday, April 13th. Um, the application of the questionnaire being made available at that time. Um, by the way, I have already volunteered. I'm happy to volunteer. Anybody who sees the notice published in a newspaper, for example, and calls the clerk's office and says, I want an application and a questionnaire, but I don't have a computer, I will wear gloves and a mask and drive it to them. Um, I volunteered to do that in my email. That's perfectly fine. That would, I would love to do that. Um, and so roll that forward 10 days from the 13th is Thursday, April 23rd um, at our regular work session. Uh, that's when the applications would be due at 5 p.m. that day. Then we would hold two special meetings the following week, which is actually already in the process. Monday, April 27th, 2020, we would identify three to seven finalists. Then on Thursday, April 30th, uh, we would conduct interviews for the three to seven finalists and either at the completion of that meeting or at the beginning of our Monday, May 4th council meeting, we would vote to um, appoint uh, the successor for the Ward 3 seat. All right, I'm gonna see if I can say that, make sure that we all understand it uh, if we're gonna vote on this. Uh, would be uh, that uh, on, on Monday, April 13th, the clerk would post a notice of vacancy and make the application and questionnaire available online. The city would send out the press release and so forth. On Thursday, April 23rd, the council would identify I'm sorry, the applications would be due. Applications and questionnaires would be due by 5 p.m. on April the 23rd. And on April the 27th, the council would identify three to seven finalists for the appointments at regular council work session. Then on April the 30th, the council would interview fin finalists at a special evening council meeting. And then on that night could make the appointment or could also decide to hold making the appointment until Monday, May the 4th. Did I capture what you said? The reason, Council Member Reese? That's right. The reason I, the best argument for having the vote on Monday, May 4th is that after the, the interviews will obviously be in some format similar to this, and that will give members of the public who weren't watching it live, um, to go back and watch that, to, to, to talk to folks about what they heard and to contact us um, for input into our decision. Okay, so the appointment will be made at the regular council meeting of Monday, May the 4th. I think that makes the most sense, yes. All right, okay. Um, uh, any other uh, comments at this point? Council Member Freeman? Just noting that uh, council member uh, Middleton is still not visually on the line. Uh, I just wanna make sure he understands uh, 
the proposed 30 days to appoint someone to the seat? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not visual on the line. I, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? Can you guys still hear yes. me? Yes, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching you on television. You guys look great. And, <laughs> and yes, I am. <laughs> and I understand the 30 days. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks for checking. <laughs> Thank you very much. All righty. Um, I'm going to now ask uh, if there's any more discussion. And if not, if someone would like to make a motion on this item, I would be happy to accept that. Mr. Mayor, as a matter of course, should we accept the resignation first, or we don't do that last, or not, or never uh, at all, or not at all? <laughs> that, that's a, that's a great question. I'll leave that to the city attorney to ask if there's any priority with that. Um, Mr. Mayor, you really only have to vote to on the resignation itself. There's no requirement that you vote for a timeline um, for how you want to proceed with the vacancy. Okay, but can and, we vote? I think but I, I would I would do as Council Member Middleton is suggesting, which is to actually vote to accept the resignation, which then creates the vacancy that you need to fill. Okay, and when would the resignation be effective again? Is that April the 9th? Is that what we said? I believe it's in the written resignation that Council Member Alston has tendered to the clerk. Yeah, April 9th. I believe that's uh, April 9th, 12 a.m. Uh, 11 59. 59. 59. All right. Thank you. All right, then uh, I'll accept a motion that we accept with reluctance. So move. Uh, move to adjourn. Yeah, so move to adjourn. Uh, I can't remember what's missing. Is, is there a motion to that effect? I'll, I'll move that, but only because you added with reluctance. Okay. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we accept Council Members Austin's resignation with reluctance. Let me, I'm going to have a, a roll call vote. Uh, I'll call each name and you can say either aye or nay or yes or no, whichever you prefer. Uh, and, and I will, uh, I'm going to just do it on the order on my, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll call on, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with myself. Uh, aye, Mayor Pro Tem. Aye. Councilmember Austin. Aye. Councilmember Freeman. Aye. Councilmember Reese. Aye. Councilmember Caballero. Aye. Councilmember Middleton. Could you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Do we Aye. do we do we accept? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, the the uh, it's uh, the vote was seven to zero, Madam Clerk, uh, to reluctantly accept the resignation of Councilmember Ralston. All right. Uh, now, if there is a motion on this process, we can uh, decide whether or not we would like to do this. I'll make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Mr. The Mayor. Process you've described. Hey, hang on one second, Councilmember Freeman. Let me ask if there's a second on the process, and then we'll have discussion. Second. All right. It's been moved and second that we accept the process as described. Councilmember Freeman. Just noting that the process and a vote um, all in the same night doesn't seem um, like we're doing due diligence, but I, I mean, I understand that you all want to move forward. So I just want to make sure I just note that I will not be supporting it. All right. Thank you. Any other Mr. comments Mayor? before we vote? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Middleton. I will, I will uh, vigorously uh, participate in the selection process of our colleagues, if it's the will of this council, but I will also be voting uh, no. I, I think uh, we can do this with more inclusion. So I'll be voting no, but look forward to participating. Thank you very much. Any other comments before we I call for the vote? Okay. The way I'm going to do this, y'all, is I'm going to call myself first. I'm going to call Mayor Pro Tem, and then I'm going to go right across my screen just like I did a minute ago, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, we'll now have the vote. Uh, I vote aye. Madam Mayor Pro Tem? Aye. Councilmember Reese? Aye. Councilmember Austin? Uh, aye. Councilmember Freeman? Nay. Councilmember Caballero? Aye. Councilmember Middleton. No. All right. Thank you. Uh, the motion passes five to two. 
Um, I'm going to, uh, Council Member Reese is the head of our procedures committee. I'm gonna ask you if you will uh, continue to work with our attorney and clerk to uh, move the process forward as we've discussed. Uh, thank you so much. I will, Mr. Mayor. I'll also endeavor to have both forms uh, uh, prepared in Spanish as well um, so that we can have that uh, promulgated on April 13th uh, in those two languages. Thank you so much. Um, council members, I don't believe there's any more business to come before this meeting. We, we stuck it out until almost 11 o'clock and I wanna thank you all. I know they're very difficult circumstances. I do wanna offer one other, uh, we've talked a lot about staff tonight and thanking everyone. I just wanna thank our city attorney, which I neglected to do earlier when we were talking about everything around COVID-19. Uh, Kim, you have done a great job under incredible stress and uh, unbelievable hours. And I hope you'll pass on to your staff our, our appreciation as we expressed earlier to our, as to the city manager and his staff. Uh, you all have done a fantastic job and just so appreciative of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. We'll pass that along to the All righty, uh, Council Member Freeman. Thank you. Along those lines, I also want to uh, thank our admin staff who have been so phenomenal in answering all of the onslaught of questions that have been pouring in by phone and by email um, and um, making sure that I recognize that uh, if not for them, I wouldn't know all of the questions that were all coming in and all the concerns that were raised over the last two weeks or last three weeks, I should say. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing that to us. Uh, absolutely super important. All righty, uh, there being no other business to come before this body, I'm gonna declare this meeting adjourned at 1048. We will have a, uh, a work session at one o'clock on Thursday. So I will see you all virtually as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Scott. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.